we'll call the meeting to order and start out with the uh, first item of our agenda, which is public comment. Hi, hi. What's up? Okay, so last week, you should, our... you should just introduce yourself. Oh, yeah. for... So I'm Reedley Burstein, and I'm the assessor and lister for the town of Randolph. And um, last week, we got our the equalization study CLA letters were mailed to all the towns. I don't know if they arrived yet. Um, it's going to say that our CLA is 78.71, but I want to remind everyone that we are in a re in a reappraisal, and so we are going to have um, a temporary CLA. We don't know what that is. It's going to be like in probably closer to 100. It's going to be like the state's going to assume that we're going to be close to our equalized value. Um, so this 78.71 will not be our CLA applied to our like education tax rate and whatnot. Um, and I just got this information and that's why I'm doing it as public comment. So help me understand how the state's going to assume something that's different from well, I we're mean, we're in a reappraisal year, right? So we're going to have a new grand list. That grand list should represent our fair market value, mm -hmm. which we're supposed to be at 100% for fair market value. So our CLA could be 100%, could be 103, 105, but the state is going to assume that we're going to be closer to 100, and that's what's going to be applied to items that the CLA is applied to. Instead that, of seven, eight point seven one. Because that's assuming that the reappraisal process will be in place and we'll be able to use that for the next fiscal year. Yes, for the twenty twenty four grand list. So. And did you? I was looking down. The, first, um, the county share. The county budget is the other piece. The county share budget. Yes. So when we get closer to that, the uh, equalized education grand list that you'll receive is not going to be the same one the county sheriff uses. They're going to use the one off my 411. And um, those are two different lists. They'll be close in value, but um, they will be different. So when that bill does happen, we should all talk to each other and make sure that our numbers match. Their numbers with the equalized brand list. So we Looking took, ahead. Yeah, we got a larger than anticipated bill for the last year, in large part because of the statutory provision using the equalized, equalized, grand, equalized list. grand list. So that's where the CLA, in kind of a, I don't call it a sneaky way, but an unanticipated way, kind of came around and cost us some money in a year where the county provided less service than ever before. We had a greater our bill was larger than it had ever been at the same time. So it was a weird little quirk of timing and circumstance and statute. So this will should help us in terms of yeah. the bill will we just want to make sure it reflects. Yeah. That's my public comment. Thanks, Bean. Our CLA. Other public comment? Seeing none, I'll um, entertain a motion to uh, approve the agenda. Yeah, um, just a I'll move that we oh, approve. I'm sorry. I saw a hand go up. I'm oh, sorry. Just, I missed you, Josh. On your agenda, you're going to be discussing the, the issue of uh, appointment as opposed to election. Mm -hmm. of the yeah. Yes. And is the public going to be allowed to comment then, or do you want me to comment now? Um, no, you'll definitely be able to comment when we have that to come up okay. on the agenda. Then I'll hold off into that. Okay, great. So moving on to approval of agenda. I move we approve the agenda. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> Motion passes. Um, consent calendar. Just the warrants you've seen and the minutes from last time, if you're okay with those, those mm -hmm. are right. I'll move the approval of the consent calendar. Go ahead. Second. All, right. <laughs> sure. all, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. 
Um, and then we move on to um, consideration. Oh, well, I'm, I'm going. I'm going to skip one here. We're going to consider approving um, liquor license renewals. So one of the things you should do as a process thing, and we usually call it out separately for you, is just convene as the local board of liquor, liquor control commissioners. Oh. So open that part of yeah, the process. Yeah, we usually have that as a separate. That's agenda. usually a separate agenda. Right. Yep. Yeah. The guy who put this together fell down, fell asleep on the job on this one. So. Um, <laughs> okay. Good. So yeah. So if you can. <laughs> Thanks for taking responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> now it's my turn over. So yeah, I got it. Um, so yeah, just maybe you'll break for a moment, convene. So, so recess we, the select board meeting. Recess. Okay. And then so open the board of liquor control. Okay. So we can just call it recess. We don't have to have a motion, right? Yep, I so believe, we'll, yeah. So we'll, so we will, we will recess the select board meeting mm -hmm. and we will call to order the board of liquor control. Right. And then we will consider, well, I guess we would typically have a, a, a public comment period Mm -hmm. for that meeting as well. Right. So I'll open up to consideration of the, the any public comment for liquor licenses. Oh, come on, folks. Mm -hmm. Really? I'm thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> right. So see, seeing, <laughs> seeing, seeing, seeing no, no comment for, for, for public comment for um, the, the, the liquor license renewals, we'll, we'll, we'll move on to uh, actually, considering the renewals in front of us. Yeah, it looks like we've got a tobacco license. You probably have a few tobacco s licenses snuck in there as well. Um, tobacco substitute. And some of this, and this is where yeah, Emory's been working with liquor control. So you'll notice those of you that were on the board a couple of years ago, the forms are different, the timing's different. We used to do these sort of post town meeting before mm -hmm. they expired in April. The applications sort of called things out. Everything's moved to this online system it's become more of a rolling process and even mm -hmm. with some of these because of flood damage some folks have some extensions so this could be something that you see in what? pieces over the next few months as opposed to that we used to have i think one or two meetings where you hit them all, at once. Yeah, so, get them all bunched. so they look different and the timing's a little different but everything else about it in terms of so it's our back to having the select board approve tobacco licenses because there was a span of time where the select board was no longer part of the process. Yeah, we flopped out for what two years, maybe three. No, it was back longer, just longer than that. Yeah, yeah. and then flopped back in. I don't recall doing them in the past. It, it's been like at least 10, 15 years since yeah. tobacco licenses were approved by select board. Last spring we did. What is it? Tobacco right, yeah, substitute right, right, base. 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 Yeah, it was like it was just a chart. Yeah, and was, pretty much. It was on there. So you got Cumberland Farms. Choose your, choose your nicotine. Um, yeah. Pot shops. That's actually cannabis control board. So yeah, you got Cumberland Farms in here. Um, Weebird Bagel Cafe for first class. Chefs and Wit and Grit. Um, yeah, so Wit and Grit in there. Sunset Farm. Yep, Chef's Market. Combi. Uh, the Summit Stores. I went through that last year. Let me see if I can find that list too here in a second. But. I think that was the barn. Yeah. There's the Summit Stores. Oh, that's in there. So we just need a motion to approve all of the liquor licenses that we have in front of us? I would make it to say all of the liquor licenses with outside consumption permits if indicated and appropriate. It looks like it's the common customers and tobacco licenses. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. And our next agenda item is to consider appointments Oops, so now you'll close, oh, adjourn close. the liquor control, yeah. Yes. So we, will, we will adjourn. Do we need a motion to adjourn? Mm -hmm. Might as well, yeah. Sure, why not? Uh, I'll we move get warmed up for the meeting. <laughs> the Sounds liquor good. control board. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We, are, Aye. we are adjourned. We'll drink to that. <laughs> and so then we will, we will, um, we will re reconvene. Thank you. Reconvene. Thank you, Joyce. We will reconvene our select board meeting and consider um, appointments to boards and commissions. Do we just have this one? Just, uh, yeah, right there. Um, so you can do your very difficult interview process. 
make everyone sweat and turn and yeah and then decide what to do so this is for planning commission we have other options if you've changed your mind since then we got a few different ones okay yeah so I don't know if you want to come on up and somewhere in the front or in an open seat. chair yeah shark tank <laughs> <laughs> Uh, are we going to stay over here? Sure, yeah, might as well. Good chair. <laughs> You're sitting in a chair. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You, you, move up, you move up quickly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Take your power. So typically just like a couple, we've all seen what you what you presented. Mm -hmm. um, the letter was is in our packet, but um, just to briefly who you are and... Hey. Your interest in being on the board. Yeah. Hi everyone. My name is Alejandro. Um, I I do a lot of committee work despite my best judgment. Um, no, it's a good time. I work. Uh, so I'm currently the president of a workers cooperative. Uh, we do engineering. Um, so I oversee I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars of business. Probably should know. Um, and I also work with a lot of NGOs, a lot of grants. You know, let these things go. Um, and it's all fun and good, but um, it's also very international. So I thought it'd be cool to get on a local committee and do something a little more material to my life instead of just you know always working with people in like the Hague, it's pretty far away. So I thought it'd be nice to get involved with something in town. So here I am. I don't know uh, anything else. <laughs> Not, not much of a speaker. <laughs> that's, that, that's fine. Does anybody, does anybody have any questions for our, our applicant? What's it? Just what's a quick example of work that you do internationally as part of the cooperative? Yeah. So I work. My one of my main uh, jobs, one of my main clients, is uh, this organization called Global Rights Compliance, and. Stop, stop me if I start going on a tangent. But this is, they do um, human rights work, specifically they do work around, um, so if you, know, if you live somewhere and there's a war, right, Canada invades America, commit all sorts of atrocities, horrible stuff. There's actually not, international law is like a specific field where you're like your local, your local police and your local lawyers aren't well equipped to do that. So there's international legal experts who you call in and you're like, hey, we think a war crime happened, we need to investigate that, we need to properly have a desist to go from the Hague. So the whole thing, that's who they are. That's like that's mm -hmm. their bread and butter. It's like peace of reconciliation projects, stuff like that. Um, and they have a big vision for like, hey, maybe like digital technology could help with this process. You know, mm -hmm. it's very complicated. So I sort of I work with them, I work with the ICC, um, and I work with a couple other organizations like that to sort of like help them navigate like you know, this is a very weird use case, it's very high stakes, um, there's a lot of stakeholders, right? There's a lot of, like, there's stakeholders in, like, on the ground in Ukraine, there's others in Yemen, there's the funders, there's philanthropists, and there's mm -hmm. government agencies, there's non-government agencies, so I like work with all of them to, like, make a piece of digital technology that hopefully one day will be useful to someone. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> a lot of stakeholder wrangling, but also a lot of coding. I'm primarily a software person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great. There's at least, yeah, this would be, we've indicated there's a term that expires in 25 on the Planning Commission. Um, that's the one that's been posted on the website at least um, for a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we have two openings. I think, actually. yeah, I think based on the numbers you have two. We have a seven member board that currently has five so people, five. so we can very much use. I think more folks would certainly help with some of the quorum challenges. And just having more voice, more, yep. some more people. You know, we're, I don't know how, if folks realize it, but we're, the planning commission right now is going to be starting our new town plan process because it's, it's something which needs to be redone every five years. And we're getting towards the end of our current um, time interval. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be creating a new town plan. And so there's a lot of important work, then the more sort of eyes we have on it, um, the more voices and more perspectives, the, the better a plan will make. So I would, I would welcome all into the to the board. Be informal. I'll make a motion that um, we appoint uh, Andro Ruiz to the planning commission. Second. I was waiting to see if Alyssa was going to jump on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great. Welcome. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> or sorry. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I had a, another planning commission vacancy related question. We have one more open spot and um, it's it's been uh, it's been recently brought to my attention what the role is of our representative to Two Rivers, mm -hmm. who does planning for our whole region, and I'm wondering if it makes sense for us to think about having a member of the planning commission be our representative to Tewark since it's all closely related, you know, in terms of, you know, how the, because the plan is we did. Isn't it presently Ramsey? No, it, it is presently be, Chris Sargent. Chris Sargent, oh, yeah. Oh, really? Okay. And so I'm wondering, because be we, yeah. yes, it was for a while. Yeah. Um, he applied for the position just last year, I think. And I think maybe he'd been, there's sort of two spots. There's two spots. There's an alternate as yeah. well, I think. I, don't I think know, he'd I don't. started there. And mm -hmm. so, um, and, and I remember looking at his background and thinking, oh, he would be a great person to have in that he role, and we appointed on, him. He used to be on the um, planning commission long ago. Oh, was he? Yes. Did he do a tour on the DRB, too, as well? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, Back I'm, in the early 2000s, he was on the board. This, this just recently came to my attention, so I haven't had a chance to do any um, reaching out about this, but I'm wondering if we might ask him if he would be willing to be on the planning commission as well, yeah. and have that more, you know, that closer connection between what's going on at the regional level yep. that could be really helpful, especially since we're redoing our town plan and not just going through other more mundane type, you know, stuff. Yeah, ask to fill the slot, and then that's when you point annually. So if there's a swap a roo that you want to make, that would be. Oh, you mean the the the, yeah. the rep to T work to is appointed work. annually? Yeah. Okay. I used to be a rep for that. You used to be a rep. For Randolph, I did for, for, I did for one year. For one year? Chris Sargent's wife was there before I was. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jane Jane Yeah, Jane I didn't know that. It's, um, it's, it's busy and it's important work. And I, I agree with you. I mean, uh, not that I not that you've asked to call for comment, but I, I agree with you that I have a person on the Planning Commission that could call us with, with what's happening regionally would, would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, and Chris was, like I said, he was involved with it back in the 2000s. He used to work for uh, two years. Right, and he was, yeah, yeah he, he was working on the thing as the same time yeah. was working for them. So. Okay, well, that's really great to know. So, so some, some deep institutional knowledge here. Thank you for that. I almost forgot it myself, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> And then um, we'll move on to our budget. Um, well, let's see. Do we have? I'm trying. I want. I want thinking, we're, We've been thinking about moving the agenda around a little bit. Apparently, well, you haven't heard from Trini, have you, Trevor? Just that she said to go ahead and, and get started. Did she said she might join uh, us. Or? No update there. Yeah. No update. Yeah. But okay. I'm thinking. So since we're still hoping that she joins us, I'm wondering if we can move around a couple of agenda items of. The certain conversations that I'm sure she would like to be a part of, if possible. Do you want to move D, F, and G up? So this is the domestic violence policy for the police department appointment, yes. of the zoning administrator in E91, and then the 24 mileage yeah. certificate. Those yeah. are all. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's yeah. let's do that. Totally. They're all actually statutorily required. So. <laughs> it's yeah. more of the impression of choice than an actual choice. Where? Uh, like like like. Like not, it's not really consider. It's like you, you kind of have to do this. Do this by this deadline, or or yeah. else. Yeah. Um, and, so, do and we need a motion to change the agenda around, or? Uh, no, you can. Once you get into it, you can sort of mix it up, and we'll record it in the minutes, and when we okay. move stuff around. We've. But I was also going to suggest that we can deal with this after DFNG, but um, in 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 deference to um, people being here who want to stop talking public comment about the appointment of town clerk and treasurer. Depending on Trini's timing, maybe we could move that above the budget too. We could. We could. Yeah. yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Just in deference to Joyce's being here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
So we'll, I'm hearing you say D, F, and G first, and then once we get through that, we'll see if we what we do. We'll with go e. with E. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So D is, and I can get Scott on the horn if we need him, but this is, we have to, by statute, adopt this policy. Um, I think it's by July 1, 2024, part of some statewide changes. So this will go into our um, policy portfolio on the police end. All of the ones that you've adopted since we've restarted are up on the website now and available to the public. And this will go up there with them should you choose to adopt it. If you have questions about the meet, give me a second and we'll... No, I'm just skipping ahead here to all the budgets. Yeah, so, so basically does anybody have any questions on the proposed change in the... Oh, um, approving the Police Department domestic violence policy? So this came to us from the Law Enforcement Advisory Board, statutorily mandated, so it's just so everybody knows kind of its story of its creation. Um, mm -hmm. The Law Enforcement Advisory Board is a, I don't know how many folks know what that is, it's a mixture of folks from the law enforcement and non-law enforcement community. I, think, I don't know if I was formally appointed to it at one point, but when I was at VLCT, I was often at, at the meetings. Um, so you've got local reps, county reps, state police are involved, um, <coughs> state public safety personnel. So it's, it's got a pretty broad set of folks producing from the law enforcement community in Vermont. And they may have expanded or changed membership. I, yeah. I haven't been to one since 2009. So. This may be a little bit tangential, but um, not having read the entire policy, it just sort of there's been a significant amount of domestic violence in the state perpetrated by either former or current law enforcement personnel. Um, I mean, there's just been a lot of it. Um, and I'm just wondering if this policy or if this law enforcement group addresses that in any way. Yep. Yeah, for example, in Section 2 on hiring practices, mm -hmm. um, this is about when agencies want to bring officers on, um, and it goes through a list of questions. And so you're asking the applicants if they've ever been served a protective order related to domestic violence, okay. uh, various types of abuse, assault, stalking. Um, so right. it does cover those ends. Early warning and intervention is in there, um, and then some, you know, pointing towards some resources, types of those things. Employee responsibilities, employer responsibilities are in there. Incident response protocol is spelled out yeah. right all the way through follow up. There's victim safety and protection as a section, and then post incident administrative and criminal decisions. So, what do we do after if we've had it? Um, a scenario arise, what do we do after? Mm -hmm. Question and address. Thank you. Any other questions or concerns? I'll move that we adopt the Randolph Police Department domestic violence policy. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Zoning Administrator and E911. I'm very excited for both of these. I bet you are. Puts it even farther away. It takes one of them away from me and puts it even farther away from me on the other one. So I'm very excited. So the zoning administrator's formal appointment that you make, this currently it's Mark, so we'll appoint um, Jeff to that role. And then if you want to keep Mark as sort of the, um, the deputy zoning administrator, basically, to provide some excess or reserve capacity, it may not be a bad idea in case for some reason Jeff gets a free ticket to space, say, and he's going to be gone for a month. Somebody's going to have to be able to issue permits. Up on the I think something Jeff would like and maybe do. <laughs> <laughs> so there might be that. You don't have to do that part tonight, but appointing Jeff so that way when he hits the ground on Wednesday, he's been fully sort of blessed well, by Is there you. any reason why we shouldn't just do it all at once? I would do it all at once. And then the E91 co one coordinator is one that you appoint. He'll assume those responsibilities. They would take them from me. I don't know that we need a deputy. We don't have that many of them. And oftentimes, as long as we have somebody appointed, if something comes in off-cycle, somebody's not available and we can provide the details. Increasingly, 
it used to be that you went out, we grabbed our what we call our wonder wheel, and you measured from point to point on that and clicked off the stuff. And normally, now, if you can get it from some sort of GPS related map, the individual we work with at the state, we send them whatever information we have, and we get a number back um, without ever breaking the wonder wheel out. So, uh, we're usually able to keep it moving. To, to the appointments of the zoning administrator and the E911 coordinator require a separate motion? I would do them separately just in case. And just then, we're and trying then to a satisfy third you. motion to name Mark the deputy zoning administrator. So I might stack them to make Jeff the zoning administrator, to make Mark the, the deputy zoning administrator, and then to make Jeff the E911 coordinator. Um, Unless there are any further questions, I'll move that we appoint uh, Jeff Grout as the zoning administrator. Should that be effective Wednesday or is that? Uh, effective. Yeah, might as well make it Wednesday. Which is the 17th. 17th. Uh, I move that we appoint uh, Jeff Grout as the zoning administrator effective Wednesday, January 17th. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. And then I move that we appoint Jeff Grout as the E911 coordinator effective Wednesday, January 17th. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Go ahead, Tom. You're all right. <laughs> <laughs> I move that we appoint uh, Mark Rosaldo <laughs> as the deputy zoning administrator effective. Um, Wednesday, January 17th. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Wow. It's been a while. <laughs> right. uh, 2024 VTRANS mileage certificate. This is another annual required task. This is where we certify essentially what our road mileage is. The reason we do that is our state highway calculations are based off road mileage by type, class one, if we've got that, which we do, Main Street counts as that. Class two, which is the bulk of our, along with class three, the bulk of our roads. Um, each one has its own calculation set, I think in statute, if I'm calling right, if not, um, some other mechanism at the state level. And then we get about, we're thinking about $208,000 based on mileage and current rates and what we received for the current fiscal year and last. So it's a pretty big deal for the highway fund budgets. The, major non-property <coughs> tax source of revenue. Um, these are all funds that are raised through the state's transportation fund. So by and large, you're talking about fuel taxes, uh, automobile fees. Those are the big things that kind of go into the mix that then come back out of state highway aid. Uh, their federal funds headed a different direction. So these are any state raised revenues that then. This is really the only direct state aid municipalities in Vermont receive. to some other states where they have revenue sharing or other aid payments and things like that. This is the closest we really get. Pilot payments, you could argue, might be, but they're really how the state pays its property taxes by not paying its property taxes, but by paying something else. It's not really aid, it's... <coughs> <laughs> cool. And we have no changes in mileage. You haven't accepted any roads. You haven't discontinued any roads. It's been the case more often than not. Uh, at some point, after a while, I think when the two of you at least were on the board, maybe even just before that, but I don't remember when Tom jumped on, but you were going regularly through a list of roads, had a list that went, was contested in court, some of them were. So it would be a good project to talk about again this spring to see if that's something you want to do, go through the remainder of the ones on that list. So generally you were looking at roads that maybe were class three, class four, or somewhere in that category mm -hmm. that were Functionally long driveways, things where there might have been maintenance, safety, other concerns. You know, talking about throwing up you know, being built or anything like that. So mm -hmm. If we have we some could. odd segments and or whole pieces that make sense, so at least look at and see if are they classified right? Do we need to do something different? Yeah. Yeah, we did that right after I got on the board. Yeah. So I think just I think the only folks who did went through that process were training and me. Was it that long? Yeah, it was a good five five years ago. It was right after I got on the sub board and I got on six and a half years ago. Yeah. And, and if I remember correctly, most of those roads that were on the list were they were safety issues because 
if our trucks went in there, they couldn't turn around. There was no place to go around. And most of them were just long driveways. Yeah, that, that they were they were mostly long driveways. Yeah, it was for basically historical. single single house on the road. Yeah, yeah. For, and there were various historical reasons why it, it kind of yes. became a public road, and yeah. depending yeah. upon the property, it was it was pretty interesting and. Contentive, pretty intense. Contentive, pretty intense, yeah. Yeah, I got on the board and was thrown right into that fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it yeah, was very contentious feelings about it. Yeah. Okay, so I guess um, I need a motion. Thomas? No, Thomas, you got to do all of them tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll motion to adjourn. I'll take that one. <laughs> but not yet. But not oh, yet. Oh, no, that's <laughs> not debatable. Don't let me know. Consider adopting, I, I move that we adopt the 2024 VTrans mileage certificate as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes. All right. <laughs> we'll see if I can grab. <laughs> see if we can grab the form for you to sign tonight. We were having issues with the cyan toner. <laughs> Mimi game they tried. They will only print in black and white right now. It's a, it's a form that needs to be printed out in color. I think we could get away with black and white. So maybe I'll reprint it. Yeah, it's just got these little pinch. Yeah. Colors. So before you go, let me reprint it, and if we get your three on it, we can hope and get it to Emory to sign and get it sent off and make sure that we hit, get those deadlines. We have until February 20th, but I'd rather not get it done. Yeah. Okay. So then we'll move on to our um, continuation of our conversation around town clerk and town treasurer. So we have been talking about trying to get you a timeline together um, and focusing on some of the other stuff. We don't have that written out for you. Um, Grace and I were talking before the meeting, and I know she has to speak during the public comment, but she had some interesting um, process-related things in terms of how the vote would be conducted, how it ties into some prior decisions made in Randolph. So we want to go through that first, because really it's at the point that, or I don't know if we want to go through, we want to go through that at some point, and then, but if you want to talk policy, or if anybody has sort of a policy practical consideration, you may want to start there, and then we can talk mechanics. But, um, I just want to make sure we didn't get sort of that lost yeah. in, in the mix. Because we talked a little bit last time about timing pulled from statute. If voters do approve it, when, you know, what's the overlap when it's a new start? We talked a little bit about what the question would look like based on how others ask the question. We didn't get sort of fully into the mechanics of how people vote on it um, and some of those pieces. And that's where there, there could be something there to, to consider and run down. Yeah, so we can start to see if people had any other thoughts about policy. We had a pretty good conversation yeah. last meeting about it. We did. Yeah. I don't I don't have anything to add, but happy to hear from other members. I'm in the same boat. Yeah. Yeah. Feel like you so timeline wise we have there is an assistant and what would happen is we would is that where we're heading is proposing that the assistant kind of helps through the transition? Uh, yeah, and I think Emory ha is able to currently be able to help. There's a, a provision in those sections of statute um, that says that the term of the office on the date a municipality votes to allow the legislative body to appoint shall expire 45 calendar days after the vote or on the date upon which the legislative body appoints. So that provides you a little bit of overlap, overlap gets you through an appeal window too, because that was part of the conversation last time about practical timing in terms of if you brought somebody new in, um, how would you structure that out? So it allows the elected clerk from before, whoever's the sworn clerk to serve for an extra 45 days um, to facilitate that transition. I think in the towns that we looked at as examples last time, they had an assistant clerk who was moving into that role, so it moved a little more seamlessly and quickly uh, based on conversations we've had. I, I don't know that we're gonna head that way just based on, on interest um, 
from the individual. I'm trying not to speak out of turn on someone's behalf, but I don't, you know, Mary's not at that spot where that's something she's expressed wanting to slide over to do. Mm -hmm. um, and she's brand new. Too, yeah. So. And so we probably use that 45 day window in some form. There's also okay. the good practice of waiting out an appeal window because then we know for sure um, that we're offering somebody a job that they'll exist. have in a month. The, the, appeal, the appeal window you're referring to is our decision to move to an appointed. It would be, the, yeah, so say you get to town meeting, the voters approve on town meeting day, there's an appeal window for the vote. Right. Yeah. What it's is, 45 days, right? I think it's 30 for the appeal window, and then this gives you the 45 days. And I think where we're thinking about the 45 days when we've talked about ordinances, it's a 60-day effective window, but a 45 appeal. So this would carry us two-thirds of the way through the appeal. Right. I'm, I'm sorry, Trevor. Are you, two can you three. say that one more time? Yeah. <laughs> so, so for this one, 30-day appeal window, 45 days is the overlap period for the elected clerk. Previously elected clerk to be able to serve without it doing anything else. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. So it gives us 15 days past the appeal window to have coverage. And what happens at 45 days? Every uh, is done. Yeah, yeah, I mean his the term to which he was elected would expire, and if nothing else happens, then he'd no longer be clerk. So we, we have see. some select board that points in to get them right. right, right. And so then you get into a scenario where if Emery's able and we need to extend, maybe we appoint him to continue on. I mean, there's different ways to kind of fill the gap. How often yeah. can we appoint somebody? Like in a year? Is there any limit or anything? Or is it just if, like, whoever we appoint quits or can no longer fulfill that, then we can appoint a new person every week if we want to? Or, I mean, like, it, like we're not going to run out of turns or anything like that, right? Well, how long is the appointment? Oh, yeah. Four, right? It, it doesn't have a term limit with it, based on what I'm seeing here. Um, okay. It would be like, um, you'd appoint and they'd be in that role unless or until there was some, they left or there's some cause for removal. And there'd be a process associated with that, more akin to, to an employment process. So the types of hearings we do if we um, need to separate with somebody we've hired to work in a department, say. And this applies only to the clerk's position. In, in our case, we have a combined clerk treasurer. Well, they're two separate positions. They right. are two separately elected right. positions. Right. With it one just person. That but do we have to ask the public in the warning to approve appointing a treasurer as well? Yeah, there's okay. two separate questions in the right. statute. It. So it's okay. that 2651E and F. Yeah. Clear. yeah, and if you remember last time we looked at the Heinsberg questions, there were two um, that they had asked. Right. Yeah, Bridgewater dealt with the same thing yeah. last town meeting. So, so Trevor, my, my questions are around the, the process. If so, we, we let's say we, we decide that we want to appoint both positions, and so or or either one or the other doesn't really much matter. And then, so then it gets on the ballot, and on town meeting day it gets voted on, mm -hmm. and presumably, hopefully, you want to jump in there, Ice? The process. This is the process that yeah, you're alluding to. This is the process to. that. Trevor okay. Why, why don't you go ahead? Yeah. And if I have other, if I still have questions, then yeah. I'll, I'll ask them after you to give us your process. The town of Randolph, right. in October of 1991, voted to go to Australian ballot to elect officers and budget monetary questions. They did not vote to put public questions to Australian ballot. So any vote to change the position of town clerk town, uh, and treasurer would have to be a vote from the floor of the meeting. I was wondering about that. Uh -huh. It would have to be a vote uh, from the floor of the meeting. And um, as far as when it takes effect, I, I can't tell you about that. But it would have to be from the floor of the meeting. It okay. would not be an Australian ballot vote. Mm -hmm. hmm. You know, this, we, we asked this question last, mm -hmm. last meeting. Yeah, and we weren't and sure when that were. And I, I have very strong opinions, obviously, because I held the position for so many years, um, that at least for the clerk position, I, I truly feel that it needs to be a separately elected position. It gives some autonomy, um, but also it gives an independent voice within the town offices on process of how things are happening. Because 
the duties of the clerk are all laid out in statute. And sometimes those statutes come in conflict with whatever the select board is looking to do. And so I, I truly feel that, at least for the clerk portion of it, it really needs to stay independent and separately elected. The treasure piece I understand because um, you're dealing with money, you're dealing with finance. Um, the, and, and the person who holds that position um, should truly have some financial background in order to have the position. So that being um, an appointed position, I, I'm less objectionable to that happening. Um, but in Randolph, the treasurer is not doing the same amount of work as the treasurer in smaller towns. In many smaller towns, they're doing the whole gamut of what our finance department does. Okay, in, in Randolph, the clerk, uh, the treasurer is only doing the statutory requirement, which is signing the checks and, you know, keeping track of the warrants and, you know, as far as keeping them um, available for um, people to see. Um, it, it's not the same as where you're actually doing the uh, actual accounting and tracking of all the finances and everything else. Um, we have the finance department. They do the reconciliation of the, the bank accounts. That gives you your, your checks and balances to prevent fraud because the treasurer is the one who's signing it. But the person who is auditing those accounts and tracking what is happening with those accounts is happening in your finance department. So having a separate person as treasurer being appointed, you know, that would be all right. But then that opens the door to the fact that you're now going to have <coughs> an extra salary to have to pay if you have a separate clerk, separate treasurer. That becomes another budgetary item that you're going to have to add into your budget. Um, but I truly believe that, that the, the clerk position really does need to remain in an elect, separately elected position. And I know right now it, it may be hard to try and find the right fit for somebody. Um, you can do what happened for me when I was appointed town clerk. The select board knew that Doris Bowman was going to retire. They put out an ad in the paper. They listed the quali qualifications and details of the position of what they wanted. People applied for it. They went through an interview process, and somebody was selected. And in that case, it happened to be me, and I ended up being here for 23 years. So I think that it is possible to find the right person and the right fit. Um, it's a matter of people out there knowing that it's there and what is entailed in the job. Um, and, I, you know, I truly believe that you, you could, you know, find somebody who, who may be interested in doing that. Um, you know, because the position of the clerk is, is extremely important because the clerk is your presiding officer. That person is running your elections. And the laws related to that, you have to be very careful to be sure that you are adhering to what the, you know, the law says you're supposed to be doing. And this day and age, with the way people are jumping all over elections and claiming fraud is happening, it is very important that you have somebody who's independent and that is not going to be influenced by others in how they are doing those elections. Um, and, I, you know, and I believe that having that, that clerk being separately elected gives you that independence and, and, and the integrity to be able to handle those things. If the clerk were in an appointed position, they're answerable to, to the select board. And so therefore there could be some undue influence in how they perform the, their job. What about the question of um, qualifications and competence and leaving that in the hand. I, I, I hear what you're saying, I get what you're saying, but um, if, the, if the public is voting for the clerk on the floor of town meeting, anybody can run, right? But we don't have them voting from the floor of town meeting. We vote out our offices by 
Australian ballot. Okay. So therefore, they have to do a petition to get their name onto the ballot. Right. And then, then they run and if they're elected, they're elected. It has happened in the past that somebody who ran for the clerk and the treasurer position, um, who thought they could manage to do it, resigned within the month of right. when they were elected. And then they, the select board was able to appoint Doris Bowman, who ended up being in that position for 24 years. Right. So it's possible to find the right fit. Um, it, it's just a matter of getting the information out there that the position is available. And, um, and right, but, but it's not like we're making an appointment. No. So, so, so we, it, the onus is on us then to convince the public that candidate A versus candidate B is the better fit? I don't. No. It, what, well. If you put the question on to the town meeting warning, right. you're going to be asking the public to vote on two questions. You're going to ask them to be voting on the question, shall the town of Randolph change the position of town clerk from an elected position no. to an appointed position. Right. And the same question for the treasurer. So it's going to be two separate questions that would have to be debated on the floor of the meeting and then voted by voice vote from the floor of the meeting. Mm -hmm. If you needed to, you could have a paper ballot on the floor of the meeting. It would mean that Emory would need to bring copies of the checklist with him to, to right. the meeting and then have blank pieces of paper for people to write yes or no on it in a ballot box and put those ballots into the box and then go through the process of counting. Right. Um, I, I understand that, but I'm going to the question of an elected clerk, which is what we have now. Right. And it's uh, a matter of doing a petition to get the name of the ballot. Yeah. There, there are, you know, by statute, there are no qualifications listed, okay? Um, it's the same with Selectwood. There's no qualifications right, listed for Selectwood. Right, right, right. Um, you, have anybody, to be, well, you have to be a resident. The, yeah, that's, you have to be a resident. That's you have to be a resident. And, 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 and the same thing with the cook. You have to be a resident. So, so, but... That's okay. The skill sets required of a clerk are pretty defined, right? And I'm just trying to get to whether as complex as the job is becoming these days, whether the electorate is best positioned to make that choice. I, I'm not saying, I'm not advocating for it one way or the other, I'm just saying that someone who is completely unqualified could run for clerk and because everybody loves them. And that's happened. Or because of the dog person who ran. Yeah, yeah. And, and that has happened in some towns where the right. person <laughs> Oh, I'm sure it has. Yeah. Um, and so then we're in a position, we, the town, and we, the select board, are in a position of having someone in the clerk's office who may not be up to the task. And so then what, I don't, I, I'm not advocating one way or the well, other, I'm just there, saying, there, that, there are you know. penalties laid out in statute for a clerk who does not perform their duties. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that person, if they're not doing their duties, you know, you, you would then have to, to go through the legal process to, to justify that and show that they're not doing these particular parts of their job and therefore should be penalized with whatever fines that they have mm -hmm. earmarked for those things. But in the meantime, well, but those in the meantime, you're stuck with that person until their term exactly. expires. Exactly. But think, yeah. in general, um, a lot of those people end up very quickly decide to resign because of the pressures of the public realizing they're not doing the job and mm -hmm. um, so then the select board can appoint somebody until the next election. There are pros and cons to all of it. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and I, I get the, that it would be good, nice to be able to say, we know this person is qualified for this, this, and this. 
But again, I, I feel that, especially for the clerk position, having that independent voice because you're separately elected and that you're not answerable to the select board, you're answerable to the, the voting public, um, is important. Mm -hmm. As a select board, how do you think that the select board could influence the elections? That would that would still be legal, right? And so there's statutory limitations. Well, you the may clerk. be asking somebody to overlook part of the statute. Well, that would not be realizing illegal. that it's part of the statute. Well, that would be illegal, though. Right. That would be fraudulent. So then the select board would then be being fraudulent, and that would be right. And that that's putting undue pressure on to, onto your. Uh, but then that person who's appointed into the clerk position could then raise flags and then there's probably be a process there, right? If the select board's asking them to do something illegal? If, if they are familiar enough with everything that they're supposed to be doing with the elections, understanding all the election laws, you would hopefully believe that that person would raise questions to somebody, but if you're in the position where you're, you you could be fired because you didn't do what you were asked to do, you may choose not to say anything. The town clerk also counts the votes, and if the select board are voted in, a resident could be like, I think the town clerk, you know, it, it's that face, it's that outward facing like, but it could also yeah. be the opposite, too, where someone could be voted in, elected in as a town clerk, and then decide to do whatever they want it to do and ignore whatever they want to know. And, and then there's no one there checking them except for the electorate, which well, then it, isn't really paying enough attention. So for the us. argument goes both ways. Yeah, that the person could be fraudulent, and the select board would be more in the know with the town manager yes, about the, the actual statutory. But, but like the statutory knowledge lays more heavily with a select board and a town manager versus the common public that's voting. But there are also a lot of different deadlines that the, the clerk has to meet in order to make sure that they're doing the reporting for the dog licenses, for the marriage licenses. Sure. They sure. have reports that they have to submit for the elections. They have, um, you know, Lodging the grand list, they've got to sign off on that. If they don't sign off on the grand list, you don't have a grand list to do your tax billing. So there's a lot of different pieces that the clerk is involved in, and there's somebody else who's involved with it. With the, the, the grand list, listers are going to be there because they have to present it to the to the clerk to be able to, to lodge it and have it filed in. So there, there are multiple pieces where if somebody is not doing their job, you'll, you'll be able to see, and you would be able to see it pretty quickly. I see it going both ways. I see the uh, argument. Absolutely. Like, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we, we're seeing elections where people are there, not doing their job, being fraudulent, and are still in charge of things. Yeah. And yeah. there's nothing to be uh, done. Without naming specific communities, I can think of it two communities in Windsor County and my own personal experience because I write about Windsor County issues for a newspaper um, where I hear what you're saying about this separation of, of powers but um, where, where clerks and select board members are running almost as a, I mean everybody knows, the townspeople know they're running as a team mm -hmm. even though they're ostensibly running for separate offices and they're not on a partisan line and so in those instances, the clerk gets elected, and the clerk is basically in cahoots with the select board anyway. Even though they're elected. Even though they're position. elected. So I, I don't think that um, having an elected clerk, putting aside the truck, is necessarily um, any, any ironclad guarantee that they're not going to be yeah. politically leaning. Leaning. Yeah. Uh, but you have to say, go ahead. I'm Annie Grassman from Elizabeth. Yeah, go ahead. Um, they're bad actors, regardless. You can't, sure. you can't, 100% guard against them. But right. as a resident of the town, I can say that it is vital to me to know that the town clerk is independent, um, rather than answering to the select board. For 
all the reasons that Joyce mentioned, but especially when it comes to elections. So that's, I'm weighing in with my opinion on mm -hmm. So what would happen if a resident thought that there was fraud in the election? So what would the process be if someone thought? They'd take it to the Secretary of State. And the Secretary of State would then do what? They, they would do an audit of the election. Mm -hmm. And the JPs are also involved too, right? Yep. Yeah. It would not necessarily do a ticket to the county courthouse. Mm -hmm. To, to Amy's concern, however, so I'll play devil's advocate on both sides of the issue here. Um, Windsor School Board this past year, town clerk also running for school board, present when the votes are being counted. It turned into a, you know, SHIT storm <laughs> uh, in that town because there were allegations by the person who lost that the clerk was in, um, um, unduly influencing the vote by being present in her capacity as clerk while she was simultaneously running for school board. Yeah. I totally understand. She's and that, that she, question comes up a lot. You know, she, she, has a, she has an elected responsibility to be president at the polls, right, and run the election. But she's also a candidate for another office that's on the same ballot. It just gets, you know. And, and what would happen in a, in a choice, maybe you could, let's say there was a contested race for clerk, and the incumbent is running. Do they have to step down from that particular race? Yeah, so, they do. They do, yeah. okay. It would be the Board of Civil Authority to then appoint either the assistant clerk or someone they deem fit. Okay. That, that brings up my, another question I've had is, I don't, I don't know the, um, how the role of the Board of Civil Authority fits into this in terms of how much of a check do they, perf do they form as on, the, on the clerk in terms of making sure that the election is, is run the way it's supposed to be run, that it's fair? Do they have to make sure there are at least two of them present when you're testing the ballot machine tabulator? And that's the extent of it, statutorily. Yeah. Well, but also with the absentee ballots, if there's anybody who has requested that a ballot be hand delivered, you have one member from each party of the Board of Civil Authority deliver that ballot to the individual so no party has influence over what is happening on that. So you have one from each party. And then if you have on, when you're counting up ballots, um, you're supposed to have one of each party doing the tallying of the vote so that no one party has total control of how that vote count happened. Mm -hmm. And then they're supposed to sign off on the batch that they counted so that if it gets audited, you will be able to see who counted these sets of ballots and, and, and whatnot. Yeah. So in a sense, we have built-in elected independent observers of, of the election um, that yes. can help hold. But the public is also, can observe the process of how ballots are counted. It is open to the public. They can come in and watch it. They cannot interfere with it, right. but they can watch it. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So the, the question, that I had earlier, I think I think I still have, which is, if if we were to go to a, if we were to put on the ballot, which would be, which would we would vote from the floor, um, that the that one or both of these positions, you know, we're, we're going to now be appointed. Um, I'm, my question is about how we actually would go about timing the hiring of somebody. So, mm -hmm. you know, the presumption would be that if we if we put it on the ballot, that that's the will of the select board that that's what we would like to see happen at the election, right? And so we would be planning for that position to become an appointed position. Yeah. And so we and we know we know how hard it is to advertise and go through the process of finding people to fill 
almost any of the municipal positions that we have, no matter what they are. Um, it's a time, it's a long, time-consuming process, and so it's and it's it's more typically than 45 days, for mm -hmm. instance. And so, you know, if we really wanted to have someone in place, we would ideally want to start advertising before we even knew the outcome of the vote, right? But it seems like that's a tough position to advertise for. It's like, well, we'd like you to apply for this position that we don't know will actually exist and will depend upon what the will of the voters is on a particular day. Um, but that's very typical yeah. for town clerk creditors, actually, yeah. very. Meaning? Well, I can tell you what. For, what I'm not sure you mean by typical, like um, the, for, for clerks that are that. For clerks and treasurers split when they're going to maybe appointed to elected. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess so. How does so so how does that yeah. that work? I, I I can cite what happened in Bridgewater last year, and maybe this will clarify. It. They had four four things on the warning, or three three or oh, four. They, they 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 wanted to move potentially to an appointed clerk treasurer from the current elected clerk treasurer position. They put both positions on on the ballot to move to appointed, to authorize them to allow to move from appointed. And then simultaneously, they had candidates running for both clerk and treasurer as separate offices. So in the event that the voters approved or disapproved going to appointed, there was a sudden election by Australian ballot. Which, and that's what, what happened is they turned down the idea of having appointed clerk treasurer a clerk and treasurer, and two people ran separately from each of those positions and got them. Mm -hmm. So that's right. how they dealt with it. Right, but I guess my, my point is, do we start advertising for this position before the election? It seems like if we wait until the election to advertise, like we're, we're way too late mm -hmm. to have somebody in place for when that 45-day period is, so, is over. So maybe the thing to do is to just as I suggested, uh, uh, put the question on the ballot, but cover, uh, and Joyce, I don't know whether you could speak to whether this would be kosher or not, but put the, put the question on the ballot as to whether, first of all, to split the two offices, and then second of all, have them be appointed. Well, they are split already. They're two separate offices. Right, but. Yeah, the same but person right now. The same the person version. holds them both. So what I'm saying is, you could put on the uh, uh, on the warning whether the select board is going to be given the authority to appoint a clerk and a treasurer. It could be the same person. It could be two different people. And then, if the public doesn't, if the voters do not grant us that authority, we could have. A regular race for the clerk treasurer position. But, but they're going to have a regular race for clerk treasurer because that term is up this year. Right. right. And her, so that would be on the ballot this year anyway. So what happens if no one runs for a position like this? So, so, I, I think so there, there you have it. If the, if the public, <laughs> if the public turns down giving us the authority, the voters turn down the authority of the select board to appoint the clerk and appoint the treasurer and somebody is running for clerk treasurer and they and and we are not granted that appointed authority appointment authority then whoever gets elected the is the clerk treasurer yeah right? I, I i think maybe what we should do emory and i can work together let's get some guidance from vlct and the secretary of state's office yeah. this, we're not breaking ground with this there were 50 something communities that had this vote mm -hmm. last year and so i think really they, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, well, that's 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 a lot. I mean, did, um, did all of them <laughs> pass the appointment? Of, I don't know how it turned out, um, but I mean, the other benefit of appointments they don't have to be Rand Randolph resident, right? They could be like a Braintree resident it, or something. It creates a broader them. employment pool yeah. for sure. Yeah. And but that would answer some of these sort of questions. And we still owe you a mechanical timeline. Yeah. That might help you sort out your questions about the timing of that. And what do we do? Do we need to? Right. How do the different pieces fit together? Right. I'm not advocating for one position or the other in terms of appointment versus elected, uh, although I do feel pretty strongly that the treasurer position should be an appointed position, but um, that's neither here nor there, but I'm just trying to figure out
how the logistics of it can be a smooth transition one way or the other, if that makes sense. Because yeah. You can't be without a competent clerk for very long. Um, what would happen, though? We'd have a hard time with an income. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's sort of how narrow the margin is. Um, well, yeah. I think the simplest solution is the what? average tenure of a clerk is 23 and a half years. So Emery's got to wait another 20 and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry, you can't. Someone doesn't can run yeah, with this like we're still a point. <clears throat> That's like what happens if, if someone doesn't if run and don't runs, change it. If nobody runs and there is a write-in vote, if there's a person who receives at least 30 or more write-in votes, that person is elected. Wow. And That's if there isn't any write-in at all? If there aren't, well, if there's write-ins, but there isn't anyone that re reaches the 30 vote threshold, then they, it's likely to be at this point. But only yeah. for the term, person, only for the term. That the person term. would only be appointed until the next election, which would be the following town meeting. It's every two days, or, or every two years? No, three, three years. Three years, three years, okay. But if the yeah. select board appoints, the appointment's only until the next election. Gotcha. The next election would be the following town meeting, unless the select board held a special meeting, in which case they could have a special vote to vote that position. Right. Yeah, I mean, the quandary we're in is there's nobody clamoring to be our new clerk. Oh, so, yeah. Either appointed or elected. Well, well, I don't the think thing it's, is, do people right. know? Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's common yeah. knowledge yet yeah. that, that everybody's not going to run it. Well, they only have until the 20th ninth of this month to oh. file their yeah. petitions. So right. we better get them, you know, get it out there. Then. Um, I do have plans to meet with Tim, to put it into the paper. Okay. But yeah, the well, timing could have been better. I acknowledge that. Yeah. No. No. No, no fault. Yeah. You know, no fault of yours whatsoever. It's just we're we're down to about. 18 days. 18 days for somebody to file their signatures. And um, I mean, meeting with Tim is great, but we should get it on the list serve. We, sh we should get it on, uh, it would be appropriate to put it on the website. I mean, um, if, if we do put a question about uh, appointing the positions on the ballot, we need to have some kind of a, you know, a backstop method for electing a new Treasurer. Well, if you change it to an appointed position, you can always go again and go back to the question of making an elected position. If that's the rule, yeah. Right. You do it with listers. Yeah. Like, I've been appointed a lister, and then my term ends and elected. Like, town clerks and treasurers can be the same thing. <coughs> sure, right. Sure. So it's, yeah, it's the authority to appoint is in place until rescinded by the voters. So meaning a subsequent vote to go back to elect per VLCT's FAQs, which are silent on the overlap elections, other questions. So that gets back to the, we'll split those in terms of VLCT and Secretary of State maybe or something. Mm -hmm. Trevor, when you're doing some of your background research on this, um, I wonder if one of the things you could find out is um, amongst the towns in Vermont that are Similarly, similarly sized to Randolph, how what 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 they're doing, whether they're clerks or appointed or okay. or, um, or elected. I'll say in the four communities I've worked for, it's an even split. Yeah. Two elected, two appointed. Zero election issues. I, I mean, that speaks to the individuals so much as anything else. They're always very good. Do you have any sense of what the numbers are like statewide? That's something the VLCT yeah. could tell. I wouldn't doubt they have that handy, especially given the the large um, set of votes last year. Mm -hmm. It's not like they had a, a census, essentially, heading into that. Yeah. Hopefully they kept track of it coming out of it, too. Yeah. But off the top of my head, I, I don't know. It's such a hodgepodge, even mm -hmm. amongst the charter-based communities. My quick research shows that um, people are keeping their, their town clerks elected but appointing their treasurers because that seems to be more and more um, 
separate duty, like knowing level funding instead of like on the side accounting. Um, I found mm -hmm. that's like been a typical. Yeah, and I and I agree that the, the treasurer position we really do need to have somebody who is competent dealing with finances and dealing with accounting. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, again, in in our particular situation, you know, I could go either way yeah. with it yeah. mm -hmm. because the way that our our, our currently structured here in, in Randolph, you have some checks and balances so that you know there isn't the potential of fraud or it's greatly reduced. Because there's one set of eyes doing one thing and another set of eyes doing another piece of it. Um, but um, what happens when the town clerk takes payment for land records? That that is the those are those are fees that are collected by the clerk. Okay. In, in yeah. towns where you've got a separately elected clerk, the clerk does take in this this revenue and then turns it over to the treasurer. As to how and when they do it. There's different methods for doing that. Um, and I think that's probably why historically with Randolph, it ended up that the same person who was clerk ended up being treasurer to, to ease the transition of collecting the fees and making sure that they got deposited in a timely manner um, and keeping the cash flow going. Um, I may. Yeah, I may. Uh, just a practical question would be, which gets the front desk, the treasurer or the clerk? If everyone comes to that uh, desk to put in all their payments and all their land records and nothing like that, and the dog licensing would be like, that's just a question to consider if you split it. And then with the assistant, where are you going to put the assistant? Mm -hmm. So if we voted to appoint the treasurer but we kept the clerk elected, it would have to be two different people. Well, I mean, there, there are different scenarios that could happen. If you appointed the treasurer, the treasurer could become the assistant town clerk. There's nothing to say that the clerk can't appoint the treasurer as the assistant, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the treasurer can appoint so the clerk as being the assistant treasurer. Yeah. We did that in Waitsfield, but that was size of the office, size of the operation. And the individuals who appointed to each piece, having had experience in the combined elected role prior, so it was, it's not uncommon, but it was there were some other factors that went into it there. But and there was one kind of elongated front desk. I mean, those mechanical questions are not the ones I'd hold up consideration based on. We can. Figure that out as long as the candy dish stays accessible. The rest of it's gravy, frankly. Like we'll figure the rest of it out. Yeah. And who's responsible for filling the candy dish? That would be a hiring. Yeah, we definitely want the appointment, or even the election. That should be a. I'm sorry, I started that. Question right there. <laughs> <laughs> make sure that one gets answered. But by, by, by the way, I'm meaning to say I'd like to see more chocolate in the candy dish. There is some now. There is. Well, That's an yeah. uh, undue so. select board influence right there. Amy's <laughs> 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 open there, peanut butter cups and Kit Kats. Hey, so oh, yeah, they got that in my office right now. Wait for it to be a, or to like the 29th for people to turn in their petition. And nobody turns in a petition. Does it still go on the ballot just 100% writing? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm going for 30. <laughs> that's, just, that's, just, that's just interesting. Yeah. But it's the same where we've had listless positions when we ran. Right. It's right. on there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the trustees of public funds, and that's yeah. happened in the past too. There's a lot of blank There was, there was nobody positions. running for it. And is but that, it's still on the ballot. Is that yeah. 30 figure just a percentage of our um, registered voters, Stat or is that the state says statute? says it's 1% or a maximum of 30. Oh, okay. We're over the, we're and because our checklist is over three thousand, it's at least so 30. thirty is the yeah. So if you leave, leave it the same, and no one runs, the possibility of getting thirty is fairly rare, I would suggest. Right. Uh, and so with it, you'd be still doing the the appointing, 
anyways. Right. Right. Unless unless someone decides they really want it and they can't, but they couldn't get their petition in on they time. They could do a write-in. They could advertise and say, you know, well, yeah. put That's letters weird. in and yeah. stuff and say, everybody, please vote for me. You could, I think you could get 30 votes that way. Mm -hmm. That's happened before. Well, yeah. I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. Just to... But, yeah, I, I see your point. Yeah, I mean, that's happened before in, in the 1990s where there were a couple of different times where there were right and votes for select board and the person who did get a lot of votes. Maybe he had one that came close from Larry Townsend. Yeah. Um, he, he had, yeah. um, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name, but it was the dentist's daughter that, that got, no, got right and votes. It was a, made it a very close vote. Yeah. So, it can happen. No, it's all really interesting stuff, no matter how we work it out. Lots of, lots of pros and cons and lots of things, lots of details to, to consider. Other thoughts about um, the club treasurer position before we move on to the budget? Okay, looks like we're ready to move on to the budget. Okay. Do you want to, we rearrange stuff? Emory and Joyce, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Your insight is yes. extremely valuable. Absolutely, and some much thank more you. deliberative, Have complicated situation than uh, extra. You're welcome. Anticipated. We could uh, vote Joyce then, do a quiet writing campaign. I've seen 30, 30, some should be a vote. She made it clear that she's done. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. with the budgets, and he's been sitting patiently, do you want to start with the library since the general fund has most of the lines in it? Sure. So and then that way we can let her go. Of course. I mean, welcome to stay all this, but this looks this happy facilitates that. <laughs> um, let me. I think I've got them all up here. Drag this out of the way to see if I can get to the different tabs. Excuse me. Uh, let's see, there we go. Well, I should have used this time while Trevor is bringing up the budget to invite Alyssa to come visit me at the library. I don't know. Well, actually, I still need to go, too, so maybe we can find a time. Fantastic. Yeah, because that one day my kids had some, I think my kids were sick the day we had it, it was little. Oh, right. Yep. Yeah. I mean, Larry and Tom, you're also invited. But <laughs> Everybody's invited to the library. That's yeah. the great thing. <laughs> So I don't know how you want to go through it. We just have revenues and expenditures. You've had a chance to look at the lines at this point. I don't want to speak for you, but it looks you look like there's a ton exciting or unusual or... I mean, there's a lot that's exciting at the library. But that, that's, let me rephrase that. There's no budget fireworks, but <laughs> no, regular excitement at the library. And just as a point of interest, the select board um, has the authority to set the amount that the voters vote on for tax revenue, and the elected board of library trustees are responsible for the rest of the budget. This number here is the one here. Yeah. We pose the question in the way where it shows you the total and then the amount to be raised by taxes, roughly. Can you just oh, so say that, that, right that, 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 that first line, it would be the amount to be raised by taxes. Right, based on this <coughs> contact. 25,000 is the amount to be raised. That's the change right there. Right. Uh, from here to here. And the trustees the, are line 490. Is that accurate? This is the yeah. revenue. Yeah, that's the way it's been listed in the sheets. That's the revenue that the trustees yes. generate in yeah, fundraising and development. Primarily from the annual fundraising letter that I hope I sent to all of you. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you didn't get that letter, feel free still to send a library a check. <laughs> huh. So through here. Administrative piece. If you have any questions, 362. The health line, um, much like we've seen in other budgets, 
Land costs are up from year the year before. Um, we're projecting increases for the second six. I don't know if you've had a change in mix or not. That was what whacked us in the other budgets was singles or buyouts <coughs> becoming family. I don't know that that's the case, though. So. I'm hoping think that my staffing is stable and you never, you never can tell. But that's, you know, what, we, what I projected here is based on the current staffing. And I think in the operating budget, the, the only thing that pushed us over level funding was the building insurance, which is the first line. Yeah, these went up. This is uh, property and casualty boiler, and there's a third component to that, too. Yeah. So that number what came from 40, the LCT. 40%? I'm betting that flooding has affected everybody's building insurance rates. Yeah, that's a, that's a dramatic increase. Because we didn't make any alterations to levels of coverage, they're all the, the standards. And we see this throughout where the insurance numbers are generally up for the property through, casualty boilers. This is all through our, our overall town. Through VLCT passive, yeah. yeah. Sometimes at the end of the year, we'll get a um, contribution credit back depending on how the pool finishes. So if we have a quiet year. Have we seen our other building insurances going, going up like this? Yeah. Same, same percentage? Uh, not always the same percentage. Or similar? Yeah. But like. Well, you'll see when we get to Chandler, for example, or example, that one's up. Um, and it's just the, the primary categories. Wow. It's <coughs> still likely to be much less than we could find if we went self insured private marketplace, but it's unusual to have significant increases from the passive insurance pool. Every once in a while it happens, but you know, in general, insurance costs, well, property insurance costs have been going up because the cost of repairing or replacing structures has gone up right. so much recently. But, uh, but, but that's a, that's even, that's big. For we, we'll go back through the numbers with them too. We found, um, just in looking different numbers, there were some differences in the workers' comp numbers based on what we had submitted, <coughs> what came back, what was listed. So we can make that round up again and just make sure. But if for some reason it's found out much later on, they usually issue a credit to us, and we see that. Can so. you scroll back towards back. the top, top again? Yeah, keep going a little bit. I just up have to the revenue? Yeah, it's a couple of questions for, for Amy while we're here. Sure. So the, the, the brain tree. Um, money that's the, through a special appropriation through them. That's correct. And so $12,000 was what the voters approved in Braintree last year. Last year. And yeah. so and we're asking for a little more this year. Mm -hmm. Still less than what they ought to be paying. And but. when you talk to the Braintree users of the library, they're happy to agree. Um, on the other hand, there's a fair amount of poverty in Braintree, and by doing the special appropriation, the town makes sure everybody can use the library without having to pay out of pocket. So that's, yeah, that's no, why I, we get this. I, I, I think it's great that, it's that they can contribute that, that way. It's just... It's it a should, bargain. It's, it's a bargain for them. It's a bargain for them. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. No, compa yeah. But if you compare the population of Braintree to the population of Randolph and compare how much they contribute to the functioning of the library compared to what we contribute, it's yeah. not proportional say. No, it's not. The, the town, the building also belongs to the town of Randolph. So. Right. Well, it's just another expense for us. <laughs> well, I'd like to think the library is something more than just an expense. Well, no, 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 of course. Of course. I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying in terms of we own, we own the, li the building, but that just means that we, have, we need to also pay to maintain it and yeah, you know, so keep it going and trustees, all that stuff. Yes. So. Yep, the library trustees contribute to that, and a whole yep. lot of grant money contributes to that as well. Mm -hmm. You pay just yeah. as much if, if, you, if it was a rental property. Yeah, no, I, I'm just I'm, I, I, I'm just pointing out that mm -hmm. the, the town of Braintree is getting quite a bargain. They are. They are. They are. Um, the other way to look at it, though, is that if we were to lose that special appropriation from Braintree, our our cost of operating would not change, and so the shift would be even further on to the taxpayers of Randolph. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, we're getting what we can get, and that's yeah. as good as, <laughs> as we can you know, but yeah. it's just unfortunate that we're, we're, we're subsidizing. Randolph, Randolph taxpayers are subsidizing 
brain tree library users. That's all. Um, and then interlibrary loan, we don't pay anything for that anymore? So that, that is a revenue line that actually should go away. We have um, funding that comes through the Vermont Department of Libraries through a grant, federal grant program, that forbids us from soliciting donations for interlibrary loans. So we still provide the service, and in fact, we provided. See, I think we've done more than 700 items in interlibrary loan in the first six months of this fiscal year. So it's used a lot. Yeah. But we can't ask for donations anymore. Right. But is it then? So then, is it? Is, does then that cost appear someplace else in the budget then? Um, it appears in one place in the operating budget, which would be in the postage line. That's mostly interlibrary loan uh, delivery through USPS. However, okay. the lion's share of our interlibrary loan traffic goes through a courier system. So Priority Express comes to the library twice a week. And we pay for that partially with that grant that I mentioned, um, but also with the postage. Okay. And how much, how much of the cost of the interlibrary loan system that we use um, is, is dependent upon how much we actually use the system. Like, do we, does it cost us more if, if lots of people use it? Does, do we end up spending more money on this? Marginally, like by $1.88 a delivery. So we're charged by how many stops the courier makes per week. We get two stops per week. And it's a, it's a dollar amount for each of those stops. If we exceed 50 pounds, then we get this marginal like two dollar charge so in a way yes if we have a lot of traffic in a week we might end up paying an additional two bucks but yeah it's not by the piece which is why it's so much cheaper than sending by usps right. okay. and, uh, oh and then um not the revenue yeah, go back up again i have one other question the um the McNair funds, is that zero because those have been used up or because we're not using them this year? No, the McNair, <coughs> the McNair funds are going toward a lot and we, we still have, <coughs> I want to say about $180,000 in those funds. The stock market mm -hmm. has been big to us in that way. So um, about 30000 of that will be going back to the town to pay the library share for the new um, heat pumps and energy recovery ventilation that went in last calendar year. The rest of that was paid for by a grant. Um, last year, we used McNair funds to match a grant that paid for a, a wage for a staff member. So, so, so that's why it was in the operating budget, as opposed to a special project like building improvement. So. So can someone, so then ex, someone explain to me why it's the McNair funds are 15,000 and then zero in the, in the revenues. Because they're not allotting them for the general for the fund staff for this wage year. anymore. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Those are, those are my, my thoughts. Other questions about the library budget for for Amy or Trevor? Scrolling through a little bit, you can see nothing wild in the amounts. Yeah, it's very low. And there's your overall. Um, the, so you're actually projecting a lower cost for heating oil this year? Yeah, and that's. That's kind of a black box at this point. Yeah. The heat pumps we think are going to offset some of the cost mm -hmm. of heating oil. Electricity yeah. will probably go up, but it's hard to say. We've only yeah. had them running for six months or so, and we haven't been mm -hmm. through all the seasons yet. Mm -hmm. How has that been working so far in terms of the comfort um, that they're providing? Um, the cooling is fantastic mm -hmm. on both levels. The heat pumps don't do us any good on the main level for heating because they're integrated into the ductwork 
So if we were to use them for heat, all the heat would be up at the ceiling, not so great. Uh, so, um, but in the lower level, the heat pumps are really nice um, supplemental um, on very cold days or in the shoulder season. So that's, it, it improves the comfort a great deal down there. Great. And the uh, ventilation, that's the unknown too for electricity. Our bills have certainly gone up having mechanical ventilation. On the other hand, we had 47 people in the library this morning from the homeschooling co-op using resources at the library, and um, the ventilation is running, and I feel safer mm. knowing that we're getting fresh air. That's great. It's, it's huge. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Yeah. So that's worth the money, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Seeing no other questions or comments, we'll, we'll move on. Thank you, Amy. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Amy. Okay, so we'll, we'll then go back to the general fund. Which we skipped over, and yeah. we were thinking we were going to look at the entire general fund tonight. Where we were, we were you had a section or two that you were planning on focusing on. Yeah, we were going to go through, I think, as much as we could, to maybe cover the basics. We did cover some of the introductory stuff last week when we looked at this summary here. Um, so just to sort of refresh where we're at in the aggregate with the different budgets, but at the general fund, we're looking at this percentage increase. Some of that is tamped down by this number right here. If you recall from last week, this is tied to the auditor's recommendation. And so it's, um, that capacity has been reallocated primarily through staffing, I would say, and staffing related costs. But this ties to that we have two projects for which there's debt service. There's a stormwater road improvement project and the replacement of some dump trucks. Um, the dump truck loan expires actually in this fiscal year, so after this, that number, wherever it appears, will be gone. Um, the other one, we've got another 25 plus years on, I think it is, um, until that, that's for I think Chelsea Mountain Road and, and maybe part of another project, um, if I remember if I'm right. So what this is, is that what we had set up before this year was that those were in the highway fund as transfers out. So we touched the money one time, raised it into the highway fund, came into the general fund as a revenue, and then we paid the debt service bills out of this line in the general fund. The auditor's recommendation was to essentially touch the money once. Since we raised it through the highway fund, when you look at that debt service line there, um, it was, if you look back to 24, this is where we've changed them to reflect what we're doing, so they at least show apples to apples. This number would have been over here last year, um, if we don't change anything. It's a debt service expense this year, but it comes out of that those two loans total that amount. Um, we also will see when we look at the revenue, it looks like we've lost that same amount of revenue. That's why when we, at some point, if we're able to talk about sort of tax rate increases, why there's a little bit of a bigger bite than you'd expect for a $58,000 increase. Um, because it looks like we lost $191,000 on the revenue end through losing that transfer. Um, so it creates some, some wonky mathematics um, from that perspective. But when you look at overall spending, like I said, that capacity has largely gone into to people, people we've already committed to in some cases. I would point out that last year we had a large increase in the ambulance. This year we've got another one based on per capita rates and other things. So to try to absorb another $29,000, and this is rough order of magnitude pretty close to last year in terms of that. So that's a two-year pretty sizable one. And I don't say that with any suggestion or historical overlay or anything else other than to point out those are consecutive sizable bites. So so you're saying that in, in FY23 it was closer to the 330 well, in that area? Yeah, we, well we had budgeted closer. We had budgeted even less than that and then the actual was closer to that. So we made the 363 happen because that was closer to the actual. And I don't know if you remember last year we were talking about the methodology because on a calendar year basis, we were always sort of looking backwards at the costs that were, 
than putting in to our budget for the year that's to come. So what we did last year was try to split that, put an assumed increase, much like we do with health insurance. So we've got six months of what we think the actual cost is going to be, and then six months with an assumed. So we had a big increase, but it was a little truer in the budgeting. This year, they provided us with a number based essentially on that same methodology where we got that number from them. Um, so that's where that 392 comes from. So they charge us per call, is that how that it's works? It's a per capita rate primarily, yeah. Okay. Interesting. So if this passes, we're gonna, the taxpayers are going to pay close to $400,000 for the ability to use the ambulance. Yeah, there have been some other conversations about how to provide service too. So Scott and his crew on the police end have certain um, first aid go bags, those types of things. Sure. We've been kind of looped into that first responder mix. So then there's that larger conversation of if we're picking up initial triage, but paying for paramedic level care to provide that that service, then maybe we need to <coughs> And as I understand it historically, this comes up every few years where these sort of competing pressures. Sure. Uh, I'm not necessarily arguing against it, I'm just yeah. fine. So just for some of this, um, this is a mixture of things from, this is where most of the health insurance and the general funds paid for. So a lot of that is in the health insurance pieces. Some of that's also in um, employee rates, retirement. Um, there's the transfer, or not the transfer, I keep calling it. There's the general fund payment for service to the police fund is incorporated in this line. Um, so that is currently up from the year before you recall from last week, but the police service committee is working through its recommendations, so that number is just a placeholder until we land somewhere there. So there's a few different things in the stew in that number there. Um, this one is, if you remember, we budgeted for six months of the fiscal year for this position, knowing that in 25 we'd have to put the other six in, yep. so that's where that's reflected there. This looks like Harold's budget is way up. It's really not. If you remember last year, we had taken a buildings and grounds individual, put them over into recreation to do that. That experiment did not work. So these two numbers reflect to them when we get into the lines that we have reallocated those resources. So Harold, this just shows essentially that position moving back to Harold's budget mm -hmm. and leaving recreation's budget. And we were able to get more hours um, for some other pieces in recreation as well. Um, using the capacity that Mark, or that the other position had left, sort of open with this move. So it's it looks like a big increase, really. It's just moving it from one spot to the other. So it's just a supervised, like who's supervising that person, basically? So Harold Hooker's our building and ground supervisor. He's in this line, for example. And then he's got two employees, Ron Morrison and Dave Messier. Um, and this gets back into as we've evolved from, I don't know if you remember when I started, he had two full-time employees that were at the lower end, of the wage, lower end of the wage scale and then two what we called hybrid employees that were shared with Highway. We split the hybrid employees out. We had a hard time finding, filling, sustaining, splitting. So one went to Highway, one went to Buildings and Grounds. We lost those two employees, moved some other things around. So we have three full-time employees to do Buildings and Grounds. They do everything that we don't contract out, which is basically the mowing for uh, Randolph Center and East Randolph cemeteries, but they mow pretty much everything else. Um, we also have a seasonal in the mix in here as well. That's about 16, 17,000 of the overall cost. Sky has been with us on and off through the years. Um, so some of it's just the reconfiguration there. And then the reserve funding, we can get into the lines, but it's up 4000 This ties to when we bought the buildings and grounds truck in the summer. We had a two-year payback plan where it's $11,000. We wanted to start that buildings and grounds reserve. This does that, adds that increase. It's offset some by a decrease in the cemetery reserve transfer, which is one that we don't use for that same purpose as the way we provide services has evolved. So that goes back to a conversation we had in July or whenever we did that. So those, that's sort of the overview of those. And then I don't know if you want to go through any of the lines themselves. Um, no, it hasn't been the longest period of time that you've had with it. Um, but much like with the library budget, the number that goes before the board. Remember I had mentioned there's sort of, there's a wonky impact because it looks like we lost $190,000 of revenue there because we didn't offset it one for one cut the budget down, it's going to look like that. We're trying to still, Mimi and I talk a lot, 
about the grand list stuff and how to figure out how to estimate tax rate impacts and if we can do that we certainly can with the reappraisal underway so in terms of the impact there I don't think I'd fo focus too much on it for now but it, it reflects that so that's where we have a $58,000 increase but it looks a little bit different on this end we looked at five-year trend lines for all of these numbers throughout all of the budgets so some of the adjustments where do you see them go up down some of the other places look at that five-year do the best that we can to guess um, we know Hopefully, we're going to be a little more active on some of the delinquent tax collection pieces just because we'll have the resources to focus on it. It's not meant to be punitive. It's just meant to, we've seen numbers creep back up after Cliff was very diligent in working them down when he was here. And through staffing and other focus areas, they've crept back up. So we'll put a little more focus into that. Um, as you come through the other revenue, not too many changes here. General fund interest, we're through the combination of, of different things from insurance fund reimbursements from the legal settlement for the village fire department to ARPA funds to some of the other things, we're able to probably put a little more of this away um, this year than we have in the past. We put in a new line for the cannabis control fee. We do not get much. Originally this was 200 bucks, but we had a run of applications for you to consider. I think we're up to four for various aspects of cannabis related businesses. So. This covers everything from the retail operations to anybody who needs a permit for any of the other parts of, of the operation there. Um, this is basically the mobile hospital trailer that we house at the village fire station, um, but not too many changes otherwise. This is sort of based on a reimbursement, keys off some of the costs. Um, same thing there. Um, as we get down, this is our contract with Braintree. We bill out annually. We try to do it on the basis of the actual costs, sort of going back for a year. Trevor? Yeah. Trevor, heating oil, those are the costs that we contribute to? This is what we get in from them in return. So Our costs are down. These are, oh, see, these are revenues. Yeah. Ours will be down toward the bottom of the general okay. fund. There's okay. a section okay. there. Yeah, I can get you there. Yeah. yeah. And then in this section, again, looking at five-year trend lines, pool because of weather, um, issues with different physical elements of it. We've inched this down a little bit, but they've camp revenue has been really solid throughout that entire window. Same thing with sports program revenue, so they're up a little bit there. Um, Are they expanding camps uh, significantly? That's Perfect. No, we've just always been really conservative with this number. I see. And I think when you look at that multi-year trend line, we can be a little more. Okay. Um, we can be closer to this one. Um, there was a increase in the cost for parents to put kids in camp last year that caused some um, feelings. And so is that part of that, that we're trying to raise more revenue for camps? It could be that that's part of the performance over the years when you look at the absolute numbers. This number's not based on an assumed increase again. It's just looking at the trend line. Uh, this burials number, um, just when, I don't know if you remember in the spring of 2022 when our buildings and grounds department was essentially hollowed out um, and we looked to do contracts. One of the things we divested ourselves of were the burials. The summer before, we did 36 of them, and they can be time-consuming. You need multiple guys. If you're in Randolph Center, you're possibly dealing with ledge and some other things. Um, and so that's a game that's now privately done, though. We end up doing some cleanup, helping out when we can, that kind of thing. Um, this number right here, this is, I think, kind of conservative. I'll put in as we've added um, that planning, zoning, and grants position, and we've know that we'll better be able to manage grants, account for and collect management fees. I think that's a safe number. $5,000 for most of the VCDP grants is the sort of maximum administrative fee. So if we do at least four of those, and we've got way more than that active right now, we can be recouping those percentages. This is every grant has some administrative fee. And, we're, this, and we're able to do this, put this in our budget here, solely and collect that money solely because we have a mm -hmm. dedicated person whose job it is to work on this stuff now. It makes it a heck of a lot easier. We probably should have been able to do this before. Um, but it was one of those, if we could, to the amounts we could, and then we recorded it, revenue would show up in audits. So, so it was always accounted for, if, but. Especially, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. if that's, especially if that's a, con a very conservative figure, mm -hmm. and we're looking at a pretty substantial chunk of the cost of that position. 
I, yeah, I think we could probably, uh, I'm interested to see what the performance is, but based on the number of grants that are available, the types that are available, the types that we could do. So some of this, like, we, I'm basing it on the maximum for some of the state grants, but we, I don't know if you remember the 15 Lincoln Avenue buyout, there's $12,000 in that grant allotted to administration wow. and oversight. We decide to take that one in-house. We've covered most of that just from that one grant that's largely going to occur in this fiscal year. Some of it will occur before then. Um, so we'll see. I don't know that we get anywhere close to, say, 50% of those costs, but I, I could easily see it being in that 30 to even 40 range, depending on how active we are. So it's now, to I'm try just to be, trying to run my mind around that yeah. position because we've talked about that position for a long time and yep. whether what kind of value we get out of it. And if we're getting 20 or 30 or more, mm -hmm. just in terms of being able to get reimbursed for work that we're doing anyway. Right. And then if that position also opens us up to being able to actually go for and get grants that we wouldn't have had capacity for otherwise, then we are really starting to get to a place where we're like getting like pretty close to paying for that position, that position paying for itself, I guess, as well. And some of this will reflect the time that Zoe and Kayla and finance spend on reimbursements too. We'll be able to bill for that. It'll include some time that um, Mark, for example, has been the one handling the New England Precision mm -hmm. ARPA grant, and we're keeping track of those hours, and we're going to charge one. So because it's Mark, even though it's a wastewater activity, we're using general fund resources for the grant management. You know, some of the, the revenue that shows up there might be from these other pieces in addition to, to Jeff's position, too. Okay, um, interesting. And we especially want to make sure we do quite a few pass-through grants, whether it be for... Yeah. GMEDC or RACDC in particular, we should get paid for the effort for that. Um, and so we'll we'll whenever we can. Yeah. Uh, map sales are what? You can largely go online and get your map. So yeah. I think if you look at the actuals for FY23, um, it was $1. Yeah. Oh, can I give you a fun fact about Act 60 reimbursement? Yeah. Um, so. Access to reimbursement is uh, what the state pays us per parcel to go into our brand list management and like reappraisals, whatnot. They give us $8.50 a parcel. The reappraisal is costing us $100 a parcel. This $8.50 that the state gives us um, was developed in the late 90s, early 2000s. This is something we should talk to our local state representatives about about funding <laughs> um, <laughs> our towns and our budgets because I spend a heck of a lot more than eight fifty per parcel on maintaining the grand list. Um, and it could be more and we've been trying to get the legislature for years to give us more mm -hmm. per parcel, but um, just keep that in mind and um, we could be like it costs us at least a hundred a minimum per parcel, hundred dollars per parcel, to maintain the grant list every year. At the minimum, but we only get eight fifty from the state. And we're thinking what five six year cycles for reasons yeah, probably. Yeah, this new act that came through, they're trying to get like six year cycles mandated if this goes all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, who's going to pay for it? We don't know. How many how many parcels? We have oh, and the fun fact about. <laughs> <laughs> the Act 60 reimbursement is that's only active parcels. So I am required, all listers and assessors are required by law to have a value on non taxable parcels, which are inactive. Um, and anything else that's tax exempt, I'm still supposed to work on and touch for the state. But that $8.50 per parcel does not include my inactive and tax exempt parcels. Um, um, we're going to pay for so, it one way or another, so, though, right? So, yeah. this, to, to follow up, how, how, about how many parcels do we have? In we Oregon? have taxable about 2,067. 2, <laughs> I was okay. right. And, <laughs> taxable and, parcels. Um, feel, oh. free, feel free to send me an email describing yeah. what you just described me, to me verbally and what you think we need to change in statute. And it's too late to do anything about it's it this late. year. But we could start together. We could start working yeah. on something um, for 
for next year. Yeah, and we can, um, assuming we can increase. I'm going to I'm going to run again, assuming the voters will have me. We could re we could do a we could re we could introduce a a bill. Yeah, I'd be happy to work with you on that. Yeah, be but it would start. But the way to start that process, at least that makes it easier for me, would be if you were to write me like a, a little note. I sent an email last year, but we'll I'll rewrite it again. Okay. And give it to you, and from Bella too. But just so you guys know, we could have more revenue, and um, yeah. I'm working on it. Okay. Yeah. So. Well, if I drop the ball in the past, I apologize. No, it's okay. I mean, you're not the only signer out there, or re representative out there. You just got a promotion or a demotion, depending on how you feel about <laughs> yeah. the yeah. Yeah. Really. But it's something that you should be aware of. We should all be aware of. Like, everyone should be aware of. The, you'll see this throughout these orange sections, just highlight that auditor's base change. So we've called them out in this version so you can see each of the three places they are. This is a, where they show us the general fund revenue. Um, before we pay them out, I'll show you where they go. Admin charges are for the um, back of the house services we provide for others by and large. Um, so we run payroll. We ensure that folks have access to benefits, those types of things. And then you can see overall, same as the increase on the expenditure end in terms of the amount. Our goal is always to end at zero. It's a kind of a weird business model when you think of it. We don't certainly want to be short on money or spend more than we pull in. Um, and we generally don't want to pull in more than we've spent, though we've been in that spot a little bit the last few years, in large part because of, of the vacancy savings we've had. If there's been one benefit to that slog, it's been that. Yeah. Yeah. So now into the executive administrative, there's sort of, these are the catch-all folks that are paid for out of this. Some of these are placeholders based on prospective hires and other resources such as this position, so we may end up changing that depending on how everything goes. Um, one of the things we talked about was trying to carve out a 32-hour-a-week position in finance um, in order to keep this budget, the tax rate impacts, kind of close. We don't have that in here right now. The idea being that some of these tasks that were going to be there could be there in this sort of beefed-up position. So we may need to address that. Um, everything else reflects hires. This is just a placeholder number. I'm not trying to give myself a raise, but at some point we will have to, to talk about next year. Um, there's that. Um, insurance opt-outs, we've had a few people take them, but by and large, um, we haven't seen as many folks head this way as we've seen them head here. I've mentioned before, pressures due to health insurance increase. So you'll see there's sprinkled throughout, 25,000. A lot of that, so there are sort of two things at play, I mentioned it. One is that we take, we know we've got about a double, we got a double digit increase for the premium year that we're in, calendar year basis. And so we've taken another six, and a half percent of an increase and added that on to the back six. So that's in there, so it's more expensive even if everybody doesn't change. And we've had a few folks that were on buyouts become two-person plans through the years and or who weren't on our insurance initially jump onto our insurance. And so the balance of that has shown up in that number and that you'll see it throughout. Uh, I'm curious, um, in the health plan, is there a pharmacy co component to that? Yeah. So I am astounded how much the pharmacy components of, at least in my own case, the Medicare um, supplemental coverages have gone up, the ARP, I've checked on other ones as well, and I mean, my personal plan went up almost 100% this year. For the one I've had for years at like $30, it's $72, it's come a month, it's coming. I was going to suggest that we just start hiring people who are all 65 or older, but it doesn't seem like it's going to help. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. or that are 25 and well, under, maybe on their in in my insurance. Insurance. <laughs> Yeah, as long as we don't employ their parents too. Yeah. <laughs> no, we need just two brackets. <laughs> we hire people 65 and older, it gets them off our. You know, I'm just I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Medicare problem. <laughs> It's, so a, it's a pharmaceutical industry problem is what it is. Retirement increase, this is tied to those salary numbers. Uh, just as a reminder, we're in the state employees' retirement system. Our contribution didn't change for the next fiscal year's forecast. We've had some big increases there. <coughs> Excuse me. We pay 21.4% 
is our employer contribution. And that's tied to years of underfunding in the state employee system generally, led to adjust rates contributions being members of the um, non-represented, non-unionized <laughs> workforce. We went first um, in terms of seeing those increases, but the other groups I think are working on the same thing to get to those funding levels that they need to be at. So people are the main reason health insurance why we're up there. I've kept the taxes here at 110. Again, we're not sure. They don't always give us a number. We should see it in a couple of weeks. Um, so hopefully we can adjust that one. Um, and then coming through some of these slight increases in general insurance here. So we didn't see it as much there as we saw in some other sections. Um, this NEMRIC finance assistance, we added this line in 23 actually. Highlighted it as new because you haven't seen it. This is when Cynthia from NEMRIC was serving essentially in the finance director's role on that basis. We were paying for it out of this line. It first started as technology, which is where we pay for NEMRIC generally in addition to our managed services agreement for IT. We've been way up when you look at actuals for years, but some of that's tied to paying for people. We have had to replace computers. We've had to do all kinds of stuff um, to ourselves. We should be able to slide into a nice consistent spot based on what we're paying. We've kept the line in case we need Cynthia for training or other things. Um, so we came to us NIMRIC ready in terms of she used it for years before, <coughs> so that, that helped bend that curve for us quite a bit. Are the, are the two rivers in VLCT uh, dues um, based on population? I think they're both based on per capita rates, yeah. Oh. The VLCT one is for sure, Yeah. as an alum, I remember that one. Some of these others, this 12.5, this gets closer to where we're probably going to end up anyway for 23 and 24, and it's time to go back out, go out to bid. So this number could even be low, but we're hopeful that that's that. The single audit that we have, um, because of the amount of federal funds we're taking in, we're going to have to do one of those. That's not shown here. We have some federal funds which we can apply to pay for that. Um, it makes sense to have one auditor do both pieces just because they're in, they're in our system. Um, but we could always and have somebody else. That utility is a key model, that's for this building? Primarily, yeah. Um, could be for any sort of other buildings um, if they aren't included in their own budgets. Um, so I think the rec ones by and large are, buildings and grounds ones are, so you're pretty much talking um, maybe here in a handful of other places. This is the placeholder <coughs> I mentioned if that was in last time. The police Services Committee is working through it. So we could see some change there. I just wanted to highlight that it's in there at that, uh, with the idea being to tie it more specifically to hours, provision of service, really the Woodstock models, I think. Yeah, yeah. Probably the easiest way to describe that. Yeah. Um, we're focusing on that. We're drilling into that more next week. Yeah, right? yeah, police fund and highway fund are on for next week. Yeah. Um, so no real changes. Like I said, we use, looking at those five-year cost averages over that. So that's the executive session section. I Here's forgot we get paid. Yep, you guys get paid. <laughs> Here's where the you real... didn't know that? I just forgot until oh. it just came up. That's nice. Here's yeah. the real it's money. It's way below minimum. Right? <laughs> I don't so. know. It's pretty close. <laughs> Here's where the real money is in this section of the budget. It's not too many changes there. Um, town reports, we're printing less of them, and they're less expensive. Um, I think there's a real possibility if we could figure out how to get them printed we could do most of it in-house if we had enough people just do like on demand yeah just because we provide a pdf that then goes and it's more or less a complete report at that point i mean not to say that they don't do things in the printing the binding to clarify things and do some reforming but we could easily print on demand from that pdf have it widely available with some different options so but for now um this is based because we've been keeping track. We've it inched the order down each time we've done it since I've been here, and then counted how many copies we end up with, how many boxes we end up with. So we keep just inching it down so that we always have enough. We can always print on demand because, and it's always on the website. The it's got to be. It's got to be cheaper to print them, to have a company print them than we print them ourselves. Yeah, right. and it's pretty nice. We've so had a good. We're using Repro Graphics out of the. Winooski, Essex area, Colchester, I forget where they, so, they moved. So since since we can print them on demand if we have to, should we, and, and we and we in the last few years we we've, we've had a lot of extras that yep. just get recycled, I imagine. 
For 26, we could do. Yeah, we. I'm just wondering if locked if in we for 25. Really, like, like, how, like, how many did we recycle last year? Do you know about how many? Uh, a lot. Copies? And there are a few. Check behind where the orca gentleman sitting. You go into that door, you'll find boxes of both last year's and prior years. We got a couple of boxes. I'm just if we should cut cut it closer. Yeah. Well, we could. And I then, think we're down to 500 in this order. Uh, we went from 750 to 500 between. Oh, the that's years. a big difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we still think we're going to have some left over, but okay. Well, but I think year one was we we're closer to a thousand copies. Now. So, so we've been inching our way down. Um, okay. Into the fire pieces, there's really not too much in here. The dispatch this reflects the cost with a little bit of an increase. We had a little bit sort of built in. We moved to Berry City last December, or I guess a, more than a, a year ago. We did that as the um, situation at the sheriff's department at the county level started to change dramatically after the election. Fire needed to go first based on decisions related to um, duty clerks, who pays for what between the sheriff's office and the side judges. So that's how we ended up with Barry City there. And then brought Brookfield along with us as well in that conversation. But we're not thinking there'd be any changes. Service has been solid. I would not want to leave Barry City. I, I just, yeah. They were good to take us in, and I, the last thing we want to, even though it's a small dollar amount, last thing I'd want to do is head elsewhere. Though we've had others come and ask if we're interested in dispatch for both fire and police. Um, but they took us in when we had no home, and yeah. that should yeah. count for something. Yeah. Um, firefighter wages, those came from the wage schedule from the village fire chief in this case. You can see there's a little bit of a hodgepodge <coughs> in that generally programmed in percent for the rest of them. There really aren't a ton of changes here. They're going to pay a little more for people to attend the meetings and the trainings. Um, How much do they get individually? Is it kind of like a select board thing? Or it's, uh, it's they each have an hourly rate assigned. An and then they, when they put their pay things in, so all three of them go in December. And so you would have approved that whole bunch right before the holidays. Mm -hmm. And then Village Fire's paid twice, so they'll go again in like June. And with that, you'll see basically a payroll report that has yeah. hours, you know, hours worked based on the calls and the trains or anything. And then I thought they got minimum wage. Most of the firefighters get minimum wage or very close to it. Mm -hmm. And then even for the officers, you're not talking about breaking the bank. I think there's only a handful of them that make more than twenty dollars an hour for for what they're putting in. So, yeah. and then with East Randolph, this just sort of came the ins and outs from them based on what they think they need for the different pieces. So. Really not too much of a change there. And then here's Randolph Center. Um, they had a change in chief. It was, it's been Tim Angel for a very long time. Um, now Dana Williams is chief. This was his first time through when he came in kind of late. So um, and whatever we can do to help them sort of work within and to these numbers and, and get set up, we'll certainly do that. And then just coming into recreation, you can see some of these changes here. These are all tied to that reallocation of people. So it's not really that we're paying. We paid our director that, paying less. That was the rec coordinator money was embedded in that number. And this was the maintenance personnel. And then we boosted the coordinator money. Some of this is due to um, how we're operating. This person, in addition to taking on some of the coordinator stuff, is taking on some of the buildings and ground stuff, more of the building stuff. So then, so, so that's a full-time position now? Yep. So let's move to that. That's been something that was asked for for years and years, even before I arrived. Yep. Um, this provides us with a little resiliency, should we have any other transitions in the in-between, too. Um, and it's offset in large part by moving by that money going oh, out. Yeah, that's really great. We've been yeah. looking at one, well, for the years that I was on the rec committee, that came up over and over again. It's like, we need, we need more, we just yeah. need, needed more staff to do stuff that was really important. And this has been the easiest year to get the rink up and running since I've been here. Um, I hear very little about it, and that's exactly how it should be. Yeah. Other than updates about how much money we made over the weekend from the canteen. That was more of an aside than something I was interested that, in. Well, that, that is, that's really great. And then some of these increase and decreases built on those five-year trend lines. Trash disposal, that's you know, what we're paying for that. And then we're keeping an eye on um, 
pool chemicals too. That's been something. So buildings and grounds again, staffing. How, piece. You, how are utilities going down here, but in general, they've been going up? Uh, we're basing yeah. that uh, on the uses, in some cases, um, more efficient uses of the utilities. They may, lines might have been a little heavy before, for example. Um, so just coming down to match trend lines. Okay. With the pool, we're also looking at sort of more efficient operations, more efficient pumps, some of those things. Um, was that the MERP grant or was that the yep. MERP grant? Yeah, the MERP grant. So some of it's, it depends on moment in time and, and whether or not they were overbuilt entering the budget cycle. Okay. And some of it's also we're finding smaller pool windows in terms of window of operation. We're finding smaller rink windows in terms of that sort of a weird combination of staffing in the pool case um, and facility needs. And then with the rink, it's <coughs> we just said we had mud season in December. That makes right. for terrible That's skating. Cool. So uh, with the pool, though, we had the pool was. I mean, I know like the season of it is changing, but we had less staff, so the pool was open a lot less. Mm -hmm. Which, um, so are we just trending with that and just going to just have the pool open less in order to keep the cost down? No, I think if we could open it more often, I still think we have enough money to, to sort of accommodate that as well. It's finding, it's the lifeguards. Right. I mean, that's when we're talking about the staff. Um, are we trying to do more of this? Well, I guess this is the rec question. I think they'd like to, yeah, I think if we could open on time or a little bit earlier, stay open a little bit later. It was really that, um, where we saw some pressures in the schedule this last year on the August end of it, mm. as the lifeguards we had returned to college um, and or wanted a couple of weeks before they returned to college, you know, depending on where they were sort of in the life, life cycle. Um, that was more the pressure this year. In prior years, it's been total numbers, it's been scheduling. Well, there was a hiccup too when COVID hit, where less people were trained to be lifeguards. So yeah. there was because of COVID closing that down. So I know that was a problem for a while. But if we wanted to create a small but unique um, revenue generator, we would essentially become water. Trainers. Yeah. Yep. Lifeguard yeah. and and um, swim instructor trainers. If we yeah. had those and then could hire them out. I have this idea that we do that and then we somehow partner with BTC to use their indoor pool during the shape. winter for town rec. Yeah, programming. that would be cool. Because that's something that everybody, everywhere, it's almost like um, inspired by the fingerprint money going up when others can I know. provide it. How like can it's, we... Will it offset all this stuff? No, but can <clears throat> we make a few thousand dollars at it? Probably. But if we can make a few thousand dollars and use that money towards programming by mm -hmm. like renting the pool at BTC, then it's a it's a nice trade off because we have younger people and ideally or normally for them getting great job training, getting great life experience, <coughs> and then be able to give it back to the community. So like my kids can go swim while teenagers are learning how to lifeguard and getting that life experience too. And then yeah. BTC being I mean, we were just there for Girl Scouts and they had no lifeguards, they had, like, and it was just there, mm. and people could be using it. Yeah, I think that's a, a neat opportunity both for community benefit, and then we'd see a little economic benefit out of it. Okay. It's just figuring out how to make the first step, I think. Okay. Um, so with the buildings and grounds piece, we talked about how the staffing has changed just over the past few years, so this all reflects how that all shakes out. You see a decrease in seasonal staff because we don't need as many of those or hybrid positions if we're fully staffed up. Um, building the grounds has also taken on more of the um, snow removal and winter maintenance and so they were responsible for clearing hydrants and still are. Um, though Chris's crew will help with that like Dyke and Dusty either went out or just going out with the backhoe to clear some of the areas where it's heavy or wet or frozen. Um, but helping with bulb outs, parking lots, all of those types of things. So that relieves some of that pressure on John's crew to try to either hit these places when they need to be making their loops and or to bring a bigger truck in there. And so some of it's using that new truck that we've got, keeping the old truck, deploying those things. And then you'll see Ron out there with his snowblower as well from time to time uh, and keeping things open. So we are also asking them to do more than maybe in winters prior and, and, and they've been doing great with it. So, and that's really helped out. So we've reconfigured a little bit how we're providing services uh, along the way. 
I'd like to say it was all by design that we did this great efficiency study and looked at performance management measures. <laughs> this is all as we scrambled for our lives, figured out what worked and what hurt, and then avoided the stuff that hurt um, the next time around. So this is one of those that, hey, this, you know, this has some. So we just a little bit here, um, we're just seeing as this building ages, we're putting more and more into it. Um, we have a plumbing repair scheduled and have it for a while. It's created some operational issues. You've seen more of us more often <laughs> uh, than you probably thought. Just Is there any allocation to our building? <laughs> you, you probably could charge. So that, that should be resolved. We're waiting for a, yeah, to schedule the plumber and wait for a weekend day. Um, but it's just an example of, uh, of some of the age-related stuff that, that we're going on to. Um, I want to point out this downtown maintenance line for years has been underspent and we've hung on to it. Um, when we talk about streetscaping, bike racks, street trees, sidewalk repairs, we have money already in here that we can deploy for all of that. That's the idea. I mean, $11,000 doesn't go very far with sidewalks. Though. No, but if we're talking about a $5,000 or $6,000 line and we historically spend $1,200 of this money, It'll cover that, and there's still the reserve, which has three hundred thousand dollars in it as of today. Yeah, but in terms of like street trees, like yeah, we could spend that money just on trees. The, yeah, we we have and we haven't, but it was more we the should, point. I'm saying like we like that'd be yeah. great. If we did. Yeah, we have a source of funds for this stuff already in here, right. and that's part of the calculus as to how we balance all kinds of priorities, needs, wants, desires. I know our. You know, our assistant tree warden is very interested in planting trees yeah. downtown this coming year. And this maintenance care planting one, I don't want to think this hasn't historically, or at least in the last few years, been used for trees. Some of the reason why we're taking this number down, um, we were spending this much to maintain the flowers um, that were hung on those hanging baskets. A lot of that was personnel costs, overtime costs, water, trucks. We had to come in early in the morning because of how high they were rig them up. Um, so it was pretty intensive, and then we haven't been able to get the flowers, and then it was also, um, we had a staffer fall off a truck while doing the watering, and it was hurt pretty significantly. So we've looked at the program. Um, the hope would be that if we brought back streetscaping, say, it might be something kind of groundbound, a little mm -hmm. easier for everybody to maintain, and or that we might be able to, whether it be a garden club, volunteers, down staff engaged and other things, so a little easier. So it doesn't have to be a Herald's crew with a certain truck with the tank in it, they have to take in and out. Yeah. And so that's. Can any of this budget be used for like matching community development grants or anything like that, or does that come out of a different budget? Uh, um, we could. Um, it would probably depend on the amount. There's no real grant match set aside in here, but um, depending on what it was. We don't usually match any of the grants out of buildings and, and, and grounds. Um, and we try not to budget for either the revenue or the expenditure, unless we're pretty sure we're gonna make it up. So the grant revenue piece up above, we're fairly sure we're gonna be able to charge for that in ways we haven't in years past. When you get to the highway budget, there's the grants and aid revenue. Those are annual. We've had them for three straight years. They're not going anywhere. We can put that in pretty safely. That's something we plan to do. But by and large, we'll show them in the accounts as sort of grant money in, grant money out. Um, and I think one of the things I'd like to do, especially as we've staffed up capacity finance, grants management, and then with Mark's role, is to be able to get a really good handle on how much, what's the right amount, can we prioritize them, and then maybe we have a good sense of what is the grant, what are we spending in an average year on match, and what are we taking in, and maybe we can show that a little differently. Um, so we've got the raw data, it's just not been pulled together. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So planning and zoning, this is the other half of that position. We funded half last year, here's the other half. Um, all of these numbers are up as a result of that. Um, there's no need to amp up any of the Supply numbers. We've got a legal expenses line in here that we could use for specific planning and zoning ones. By and large, we're spending most of the legal money out of the general legal services line up in the executive section at the very top. 
Um, and we haven't, knock on wood, seen a need to utilize it. When we've had bigger cases to deal with, such as the fire station or the accident out um, on Ryford Brook Road, those, our legal services were provided through our insurer. Um, so we had attorneys that were set up through that process, paid through that process, represented us wholly, but didn't appear on that general <coughs> legal line. So we've had those bigger, longer term, long year cases, that's how we paid for those. And what you see here is <coughs> for the stuff in between. So when we talk about 10 Dudley Street and whether there's anything we do, we get into, we're gonna, I think, have a conversation about a blighted and unsafe property and, and how to do that on manager's drive. That'll be where we engage and use some of those funds. Um, so there's a line here and we've left it, but it's if you need DRB or other guidance. But So there isn't really a need for supplies. Lister's budget, again, pay and benefits, um, moving Mimi up to a rate that both matches her abilities, her continuous improvement in education, um, where her peers are throughout the state, very fortunate. So that's why if that one looks a little bigger, this is, I think, a long overdue move regression to the mean. Is she currently it, elected or appointed? She's right. appointed by the Lister's, and so this is one that we talked about together. Uh, okay, so she's an administrator. Yeah, I think I actually gave, okay. said to them, do you want to pay Mimi more given how much she's put in? Sure. Um, I mean, she's at the vanguard of continuous improvement education for us, so re really soaking up those opportunities. Um, for fun facts? Yeah. And then she brings we you fun we, facts, we and I don't bring you ever bring you fun facts. facts. Right? Yeah. <laughs> We're definitely behind. <laughs> and so they've got their own legal line. This is um, you know, tied to reappraisal, thinking there might be an uptick in that, I think, primarily. And the same thing with professional services. It looks like we got a line missing there um, from a formatting perspective. But um, so that if they need for some kind of follow up to commercial property appraisal, could be what's most likely for that. Um, in the clerk treasurer's budget, some of the decreases are, these are simply tied to the fact that um, Mary makes less than Ann did. Ann was a tenured employee with a rate that was at sort of one end of scale. Mary's new as a rate sort of mid-scale um, with some adjustment to have her position match some of the other organizational um, you know, similar categories. So there's a little bit, even though it looks like a decrease, there's a little bit more for Mary in there than just the 3% the she's uh, killing it too, so it's also performance related um, in, in terms of, of being earned. So that's why, but some of that is just tied to one employee to another, one making more, one making less. It's pretty simple. And they're operating, but we have a little more on election expenses 25. We've got everything from primaries to presidentials to town meeting, and this matches where we've been a little bit in prior years where there were similar conditions. And so that's why there's that increase there. Mm -hmm. Ambulance services appears here on its own line, like we said, nearly 30 grand. And we've highlighted the Chandler one. You can see the insurance piece here is up. So we'll dig back in because it's a couple of buildings, but ours seems less effective. Could be because ours is not of historic value. Those other pieces. And then the fuel oil one, we're leaving the same though. Um, yeah, we're looking at sort of multi year trend lines there. In the debt service one, this is where you see the three time again. Those are the orange ones. These are the ones that are leaving the section per the auditor's recommendation. All the rest of them stay here. We've got a mixture of this highway or public works related stuff, building stuff, the Chandler bonds, some splits. These were the two that were highlighted with the auditor, so that's why we're moving on those and not others. Some of these, frankly, given the lifespan, um, uh, we can look at, at, at farther moves, further moves. Uh, additionally, we don't need distance. Um, about that, but this is pretty well set. We start to see debt retire in fiscal 26 to 27 in terms of debts start to come off the books. Chandler bond. I think yeah. Chandler bond gets close. Yeah, I've got a debt it's service schedule here. Close at this point. Let me take a quick look. The 20 year bond, right? I think that one was 20, yeah. Let me see here. I got a. I can't remember if it's 20 or 30. I think Chandler was another, we have another three years. Right. So we've got, you know, in 26, we see that dump truck. The dump trucks I'd mentioned to you. Um, there are a few others that come off, and then in 28 we start to see even more of them. Um, but that's when we start to buy down some of the debt. And as we've talked about, probably one of the priorities 
we pay less in debt service, that's more money for everything else we have to do. Debt to expenditure ratios, all that exciting, not fun fact stuff. Um, no transfers out. We keep these lines. They're, we haven't really used them for a while. And then in the reserve funding, this is where we mentioned in the summary, the reduction in the cemetery, and the creation of the building and grounds reserve. And some of this is we had been, um, there was sort of no unifying theme how we were paying for stuff there. So this could be everything from, um, you know, the building they used down at the landfill has needing, needed heating system stuff over the years, and we should plan for something um, probably a little more functional for them. There's no restroom at that facility, for example. Um, it was meant sort of as a temporary thing that we've now extended into sort of full-time use. Um, mowers need to be replaced. Those are big cost items. Um, any other equipment that they use, in addition to their own trucks. So this creates a space for those to be paid for. Some of them have come out of the cemetery or reserve through the years, but um, this is something that's We've been talking about since I got here, when we did the truck, we sort of turned the skis downhill and put it over the cliff, so, um, so we committed to it. So it's only about a $4,000 increase overall, and you get to, as everything nets out, about $58,000. Um, no new programs, no real new services. We're trying to provide what we've provided with greater consistency and efficiency. We've talked a lot about internally and in building this budget and generally um, sitting down in February and creating a work plan for the year that we think is realistic that we can stick to. Some of that will include tasks for you all to agree with. So it's everything from our personnel policy is overdue for an update. We have ordinances that are 40 plus years old. There are systems that we need to, we could sharpen up um, things that will then translate hopefully into you know, when Joe comes in and he needs something for us, regardless of who's here, he can get it effectively and efficiently, rather than waiting for someone to be here, because this is closed, that's closed, you know, stuff that's available online. So just sort of taking that leap from, I think we've got a group with a lot of potential, we've got a high ceiling, now we've got to turn into performance and consistent performance. That. Can we be a little more organized? Our grants management piece is a big one. We're hiring capacity for that, been talking with finance for that. So everything from how we manage the grants we already have, how we pursue outside grants, how, what's the right number of them for us to manage at a given point? Because we just tend to, when it comes to grants, we're like Pac-Man. We'll just, if it's there and in our path, we'll eat it. Um, it would be nice to be a little more thoughtful and to use that capacity for stuff that we want to make sure that we really want to do. And so some of this all fits into that. So that's why we're not looking for to add anything new to build up the capacity we've been talking about for years. One of the things that's not in this budget, in addition to that 32 hour week position, are any engineering services money. So we might try to build those into project pieces. We have a certain amount of that incorporated into the ARPA asks on the town list. So if we have to take a seat on that one, and we're talking $15,000, $20,000 there to get engineering capacity, we're okay if we're covering it somewhere else for the things that we really need it for. Um, so there's some of the thinking in that. So there's, like I said, this is a budget that enables us to be fully staffed um, and to just get a little more consistent at what, at what we need to do uh, and, and kind of grow into it. Huh? Question. So this, so we're looking at a 1.5% increase in the general fund budget, mm -hmm. uh, which is way under inflation this right. past year. Um, we've increased salaries, in some cases significantly, we've increased positions a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had increased, big increases in certain insurance, medical and property, and yet, so we're, is, we're, we're like. It's that move of debt service. Is that the big, that's the big difference? That's so when you look at spending from year to year, that's why it stays within $58,000, even <laughs> though we've added that other capacity, is because we're not spending that back out on the debt service. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason why we kept it at that 1.6 is because knowing that there's a corresponding change in the amount to be raised by taxes. So knowing that those two, th in a normal year where we don't move anything around and we had a $58,000 increase, whatever you're seeing on the plus minus, is probably going to be pretty similar if all the other revenue holds. 
but this is not that year in order to accommodate that reclamation, which makes perfect sense, eliminates the potential for error. We raise it in the highway fund already anyway, so there's no impact on that budget to move it around. So some of that's why you look at so less than an inflationary increase, but it's knowing that that number is going to be a different kind of a bite. If you take just the last grand list value that we had, knowing that that's not going to be the same, that's a five cent bite, for example, which starts to feel a little substantial. So it's balanced a little bit about that. Throughout all of this, we tried to be thoughtful and balance all the competing priorities. Yeah. And yeah, there's not enough room for everything, but we made it enough room for everything that we could. But yeah, that was the factor in staying low. Because it's like, you look, at first I got really excited. I saw it was 1.58%. It's like, well, we get the 32 hour week back in, and the engineering stuff back in, and a few things back in. And this number kept gnawing at me right there. Yeah. And it would even if we were able to calculate it to the penny. I still think, you know, that's, we just want to be mindful. Yeah. Especially because when we get to the highway fund, we're going to see increases there. Um, slight ones in the library, nothing big, but there's still an increase there. There's an increase in the request for special appropriations. <coughs> and then whatever we end up doing with the police fund is likely to be an increase of some kind for someone. Because yeah. um, the one thing I think everybody agrees on, what we're doing doesn't work. I don't know if everybody agrees on it. That's the one thing that's consistently come up yeah. as an area of agreement. So, okay. And then that's before you get into the things we don't control school taxes and right. other yeah. things. Right, right, right. Just kind of life. But we generally try to be mindful of it and use our 30 cents of capacity wisely or whatever it works <laughs> out. Okay. Do you want to see the special appropriations? They're at the very bottom that won't be. Take very long. Take a quick look at uh, that. Yeah, but that was the third thing on your. And this is what we expect. Yep, based on what. They're not all. They haven't all come in yet. Have no, they? there's still time to petition for increases. So this is in the case of the senior center. Um, this is we've got a petition. It's been certified, validated by Emory, so we know that they're on the ballot for this. Mm -hmm. A lot of the other ones. Um, if I. No, if most of the other ones... Um, they just re-upping automatically? Yeah, and we've got their annual reports, and as part of that process, they submitted us letters saying what they intended to do with their asks. And um, the so policy and practice is that if you're level funding, you don't need to go through the petition process. It's sort of a right. straight shot onto the warning by policy, because you can place them on or not. But if you want an increase, right. you right. petition so, away on. So we're expecting everybody to come back with the same request, except for the senior center, which yeah. is going to ask us for more. I'll go back through and we'll make sure that we've got everybody's number, but looking at this, I've got um, nine or ten of them have confirmed, you know, through the stuff that they provided us, that they're looking for level funding. Um, okay. And so this one, unlike some of the others, this is straight in terms of how this is paid for. There's no revenue offsets. This is a straight property tax payment for these groups. We had one small increase last year, too, so it's not like we often see requests for increase in China. The food shelf last year went up to 5,000 from two or 3,000 was the petition increase, um, and based on need and utilization. Um, and that's what they were seeing. Okay. So that's that piece. We're going to do more capital and improvement program stuff next week. John and I have to sit down and talk paving. We want to cost out a sidewalk machine to provide better maintenance in the wintertime. If we're going to have more variable weather, and it seems by all accounts we are, um, this storm, it was really hard for one operator, one machine, one everything to get around and get those things done in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. We can get a second one, we get some additional attachments, and then we have two machines that can go out there and do Yes, the winter maintenance pieces, but we don't have, say, a mowing device that's more like a brush hog for the other one. Keeps the cost lower, gets a piece of equipment. That's how we mow the landfill, solar panels, some of those pieces. Gives us another tool to deploy. We already have a broom for it, so when we sweep intersections, we sweep prior to painting sometimes. Um, now we put two people in them, maybe pull some buildings and grounds capacity, get out there and get those sidewalks taken care of with a little more. <coughs> That, I think that would be really great. Speed. So that, yeah. that was one of the ideas that as we've juggled response to weather this season, I mean, we had this last year too. It just didn't seem, I think that December storm, December rain, just last storm, it's certainly right there for us. But, yeah. 
But even even last winter, there were days where it, it just took a while to get to all the sidewalks. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I know there was uh, times where I saw people like you know walking in the middle of mm -hmm. Pleasant Street because the sidewalk on the side of Pleasant Street was just full of snow that had just been plowed onto it, you yeah. know, from from the street and. Um, yeah. And the machines actually, it's, we had the plows before, which is a little faster, I think, depending on the type of snow, but we've got the snow blowers now. So when you or snow the heavy, yeah, wet, I mean, yeah, the heavy wet stuff takes a different sort of finagling with the wet. But, but, uh, but yeah, when, whether it's a snow blower plow, just the, just the idea that having more than one machine yeah. to send people out on, if that meant that the, some of the sidewalks got cleared a, you know, a little bit faster, I think there's a bunch of people yeah. who walk around downtown who really appreciate that. Yeah. That's that's one of the thoughts. That's an area of investment mm -hmm. has a real impact, has a real benefits, an area of need, and we can make it flexible in terms <coughs> of get other usage out of it. Yeah. So and and we've been talking about having more sidewalks, not less. So just yeah. even more need all over time for that kind of service. Yeah. So those are the pieces we want to make sure we add. Um, when we get to the capital plan, we'll have open questions as to police vehicle replacement. Ties into the police services committee stuff. Ties into the creation of the capital reserve. Ties into where we're at in the process. We're going to need to replace two of them one way or the other. So there are those types of open questions. One of the things I've mentioned, a minor change we've done in five-year looks. I kind of want to do a three-year look to tie it to our debt service, to tie it to the allocation of ARPA funds, especially if we spend money on engineering and estimates. So that we have a multi-year plan that we can truly live out. We do the five-year plans and then we do the year to the extent that we can, and we essentially start over again and either push everything out, reconfigure some stuff, and we do it. And that is common, most municipalities. You should look at them every year. That's the spot a lot of municipalities are in. Um, but it'd be nice to set a three-year plan budget to it. And then it ties into some other projects that we want to do over that work plan year. Some long-term financial planning. Oh, that's clever. Yeah. And I stole it from Brattleboro. But. <laughs> But the idea being that we can see over a longer trend line where we want to go and a better plan for it. So then we can do more pay as you go, whether it be things where we avoid debt, increases or changes in service. So it's really all about can we get better organized and more consistent? Because we've proven really good at running around and running for our lives, but now we're all tired and we want to plan. <laughs> and I've got a capital flow chart, I had it in your. Packets. I don't know if you want me to pull it up on the screen or review it. It was just to sort of remind everybody of how the, more or less, the money flows through that. Most of it's out of the annual expenditure budgets as reserve transfers and or as direct as service payments. We also have grants on the water wastewater fund end. Those are enterprise funds, so rate payers mm -hmm. pay those. I don't know, we've got some exciting things going on on those ends, especially on the water end. Um, not just the North Wells project, but remember we're doing that lead service line inventory too mm -hmm. states covering that it's man it's again it's one of those choices it's not a choice but nice that they're providing the funding for it that'll be another piece of the discoloration puzzle because it'll identify those lines of a certain era that are likely to assist in you know we could upgrade all of our lines and all of our water sources and take out all the manganese and do all the stuff but if you still had service lines certain age with certain things individual users might see something different than their neighbors, depending on. And we get more of the lead out of the, uh, of the system. So that's underway too, and that'll come with a capital plan. And those service lines aren't ours, but it helps identify costs, can help homeowners, businesses, other people plan. Um, so, Like I said, in most of the budgets, there's nothing new and nothing exciting. In that police budget, there's all the excitement you're ever gonna need for a second consecutive year. <laughs> Are you talking about your drama when you get on the select board? When you got on the select board, Larry? What's that? You were talking about the drama when you got on the select board. Yeah. Yeah, that was my yeah. compared to <laughs> what we were doing. And we will try to figure out some way to <clears throat> provide some range of impact for people too. Because a lot of times people will go, they want to know what it's going to cost them. Right. And totally fair, totally normal question. And the reappraisal makes that harder to answer. So we'll try to figure out a way to reliably say, at a minimum, what we're thinking is maybe range of outcomes, even though the more information you provide, the muddier it gets, the more it can be twisted and misshapen. 
but I'm not entirely sure how else to do it when you don't have a number. Um, at the it's bottom. It really comes together nicely. Yeah. <laughs> like every meeting now, I was like, I have not been in this spot in 20 years, so thank you for furthering my education. <laughs> <laughs> I need to just go get started. So, just to yeah, recap, we'll do police and highway next week. Um, maybe on the 25th, we can do water and wastewater quickly, even though they're enterprise funds. They still go through the same process, but they do the remainders. You've seen everything else. Um, and we'll do capital over those two weeks as well. Um, paving plans the big domino. Um, that was the one we pushed to the front. I also want to take some time to think about gravel road projects in light of everything we've already done because of December and then equipment. And some of it with the three year, there's just some conversations. There's information we need in conversations we've got to have that are bigger than this year. Trini's mentioned it a hundred times. The fire truck conversation is just hanging out there. We've got nine trucks, and it would take us 30 years and four and a half million dollars to replace the top five, based on the exercise we did in August with the fire services folks. Right, someone's got to change. So something's yeah, we're gonna have to figure something out. Um, but it's probably not gonna happen between now and February 4th. So we'll keep building those reserves. At least be thinking about the next truck, because that we can reasonably do. But I have never been in a budget process with this many open questions this late. So it gives me a little bit of a little stress. Jeff, I'm good. Question and a comment. Yeah, go um, ahead. Question on the town report. So a number of years ago at the select uh, at the, at the uh, town meeting, they voted to um, just kind of distribute town reports to Floyd Store, East Randolph, and that. But um, you know, there's a few of us, a few, a few neighbors, should I say, they also agreed at that town meeting that if someone called to have one mailed. Um, that they would do that, and I always had one mailed. I, I get one from a property owner in Bethel as well. You know, it just gets gets mailed to me. I'm not saying that I'm going to bust the line here, but is that still an ability to be able to, you know, call the town clerk and say have have one mailed? Just because I've got some elderly neighbors, and they're not exactly computer illiterate either. <laughs> you you yeah. know what I mean? To be able to do that, sure. so can they still call to to get a town report mailed to them? Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. it's just a, that's a, it's just a, a question that, that I kind of had. Yeah, um, you know, I can have you know the neighbor that, you know, uh, get get into the town's website is not the easiest thing to do. You yeah. know, sure. you, you know, so I just want to understand if that's still if there's still that ability there because that's the way it was kind of presented mm -hmm. at, at at town meeting that year. Yeah, yeah, and certainly willing to get them to folks however they want them. Right. Yeah. The other, the other comment I have, and Trevor, you need to cover your ears, um, because the other comment I have is, I, is I, I really think the town manager's salary is under where it needs to be. Um, that's my own personal feel with the amount of FTEs that he has to manage, with the amount that he has to manage there, and what, to, what today's salaries are. Um, and I don't know what the today's salaries are for town managers. And what is there, 73 communities, 75 mm -hmm. communities that have a town manager, form of government? Heartland just town. hired a new town manager at, a, I think, 118 or something like that. Yeah, it just seemed, you know, I, 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 I see him, I see him at night, at least at, at that one committee meeting. Well, you know, maybe he is again at night here, but, you know, the amount that has to go into to, to being a town manager, I, I think that we... Sometimes uh, take advantage of that bargain. Yeah, no, I, I yeah. that is not an argument that falls on death. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't know contractually or, or any of that where any of that oh, stands. I just, I just, I, I, and I haven't looked at the budget in the last yeah. couple of years, at least town manager line. Yeah. You know? yeah, and it's, it's actually not just the town manager. We've been trying pretty hard to raise salaries for town employees in general, but especially the, um, the department heads who are, you know, a bunch of talented 
people who work really hard and right, right. and we really want to so yeah. much we appreciate them. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you see other other line items and some of them in some people's minds. I'm a conservative guy, so in some people's minds they say, well, why are we spending money on this? Why are we spending on that? But then there's other areas where you have to manage that many people, that many square miles, the many miles of road, that many you know the waste the, the wastewater yeah. infrastructure the the granting and all of you're, that. You're, and, you're, you're gonna. You're talking to the choir here. I oh think. yeah, yeah. No, I think you can certainly get no argument from me. Yeah, yeah. So I just, I just, I just think it's also it's a great thing for attention. You know, yep. There's a lot of cheaper, open, there's a lot of open positions. It's outside. cheaper. It's cheaper to pay people a little more than to hire new folks. Yeah. Oh yeah, and the sure. your training process for the first two years, you yeah. figure out where you are, right? You know, you know what I mean? In, 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 in any industry, yeah. you know. So there's yeah. that. That's just my comment off the head. Yeah, I uh, no, appreciate uh, it. So, right. so um, are we done with our agenda? We're, we're we ready for manager's report? Uh, yeah, sure. That's it. Yeah. Have a good night, Joe. Take care, Joe. Thanks. What, what, what uh, date next week is the, uh, is this, is this same meeting, same spot? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Thursday, same 5 Same spot, 30. same time. Yeah. Same, okay, great, same, great. Thank you. All right. Same, great great same great fun. Just look at <laughs> my written report here. Same back channel. <laughs> For those of us who remember More that old next show. Week I'll be there in person. Oh. Mark it on the calendar. Right. Party. <laughs> Um, so Alyssa and I discovered that we are both turning 40 this year and within what two weeks of each other so you yeah. we're here in February oh, wow. right? Yep. Yeah. So my last night being in my 30s, I will spend with you guys on the 25th. Oh. Uh -huh. week after. Uh -huh. And then Alyssa is a few weeks Wow. Ago. What a life yes, transition. I know. Yes. <laughs> I just want to let you guys know. I think we should have pizza for your last uh -huh. night. I think so. And, yeah. We'll do Essex style. We could call it a budget workshop and we get pizza and drinks and snacks. We can find a good pizza. Or we'll get through the agenda fast and then go get a drink. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the real motivator, yeah. Let's, let's have some better ideas here. <laughs> so not too much to add to the written report. Um, just want to point out again, it looks like the December storm and mud season that followed will be eligible for FEMA reimbursement. It's really good. John and his crew, they've just been getting after it. Um, we did some snow removal activity last week. They were thinking about everything from places to store snow to places for the water to go. Um, they are just, this new crew, this has been great. Um, but they're thinking ahead doing all that. We still need to get Chris and other guy, though they're still doing the same great stuff there. Um, that's kind of our one short position other than the one in my office, but which would be nice to fill too. And then I think there's that, with the FEMA stuff, we're hoping to push to the stuff, to the forward, um, to the front, the stuff where we get reimbursed sooner or later. Um, we're going to have the bylaw amendment hearing on February 8th, it looks like, just based on timing and notice stuff, so we'll, we're still moving that process forward. There's just that piece to consider. Uh, we'll keep trying to get you stuff. These weekly meetings are a little hard to generate content for you, so I will keep trying to to do that and get ahead. Um, there are a few pieces I wasn't able to get you, like with the timeline stuff, that hopefully we'll be able to do. Um, we have another Monday holiday, which I'm not complaining about, but <laughs> short weeks become short weeks. Um, so, I think that's, I'm trying to think. I felt like there was one other thing. Nothing major. I have the revised loan documents. You don't have to take any action. We have to resign them. The ones that say chair, I have to hunt a tree down here. I think there's a resolution yep, to sign in here that you guys can sign. And then um, this was tied to, the, there's sort of two pieces for the, the three of you can sign. Um, the repayment schedule, it was showing, I don't remember from last week, less than $2,000 in total per year, which would have been lovely for 40 years. <laughs> it's really closer to the $27,000. We budgeted for that. We saw it in an earlier sheet, so it was no big deal. It didn't impact anything on our end. They caught it very quickly on the DEC, the SRF program in the bond bank end, so I'll try to separate that out for you before we go. And we can start getting our money back.
We had our first reporting timeline for that NEP DEC ARPA grant. Let's just say that the agreement that we forced everybody to sign really came in handy. Mark was able to use it up and down the stream. So with the business and with the state to keep us out of a sticky wicket. So his application plus the way we decided to set it up, it worked. Go Trevor. Go, go team. <laughs> That was all I had. You did the executive session thing, unless there's something you have that I don't know about. Um, but you appointed Ali during the meeting, so you're good to go. <coughs> I don't have anything else for it. I'm okay with that. So if there's, so if there's nothing else. Oh, 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 wait, wait. Oh, oh, this oh. one's mine. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excuse me. Going to the glory oh motion. I knocked stuff over. Okay. Um, I would like to motion that we adjourn the meeting. Alyssa, do you want a second? A second. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll defer my usual motion making machine here. <laughs> you guys sure? Um, all right. All, all, all those in favor. Aye. 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 <laughs> We're adjourned. Okay. Thanks, folks. Bye. So, do you have.